Sorry that you didn't have sound. You missed the pledge. That's not good. You guys can say it at home if you want. Parker, Chase, Macy is here. Have you seen Jocelyn? Paul, Grant, Jerilyn, Donde Esta. So today's going to be one of those days where uh, the beginning of this, you can just kind of listen to the sound of my sultry voice. Welcome to WSPY. Um, Radio 107 to the left. I'm going to be reading you something. Um, I have it in Google Class if you want to follow along. It's Reality and Imagination, the beginning of the book of Measurement, a much less interesting title. This is just the prologue, if you will, um, by Paul Lockhart, mathematician and author. I thought we'd read it to get started in geometry proper. The Geraldine Wilson. Oh, man, what a name. You're present. Grant's here. Macy's here. Thank you for telling me there was no sound, Macy. Hey, Sandra, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm so glad you were in my class this year. <laughs> Chase, Jocelyn, Parker, Paul, Donde Esta. Let me know if you're here. Like I said, I'm going to be reading this bad boy. If you want to follow along Google Class, go for it. If you don't want to follow along, that's fine. See if I care. I'll try to keep it up on the board. No promises. I think if we just read a little bit, you know, reading's fun. Y'all like to read? No? Yeah, you like to read? Who doesn't like to read? Yeah? Is it okay if I ask why not? Not to shame you. I think it's a totally valid answer. Why don't you like to read? Did you used to like to read? No, never. Never found a book that you enjoyed? Maybe a few. Any books in school that you enjoyed? No. Isn't that interesting? One of my goals, I'm not sure if it's my number one goal, but it's definitely one of my goals, is to, whatever I'm teaching, whether it's math or music, because I used to be music, but whatever it is, is to create an appreciation and love for it, and not to destroy whatever appreciation and love for it that you might have. I feel like school typically does the exact opposite. Here's a book. You need to read this many pages by tomorrow, and you need to answer a bunch of silly questions. My English teacher, who hated me and then loved me when I got to senior year, funny how that is. Um, hey, Chase. Hey, Jocelyn. Parker, Paul, Grant. Yep. The only thing that matters. Ooh, that's major. Well, no, the only thing that matters. Right, yeah, you like real stuff. Gotcha, interesting. That's good to know. Well, welcome to geometry where everything's made up. All imagination. Triangles, as we'll find out, do not actually exist. Been lied to. Yeah, triangles don't exist, neither do circles, neither do numbers for that matter. Everything is made up. This is not made up. I'm not made up. We're not made up. I mean, we could be, right? There's simulation theory or whatever. We're all in the matrix. You don't know what that is. That's a movie. You like it? No? Okay. Um, yeah, my uh, history teacher, or my uh, English teacher, um, had us read this one book. It's called Gentle Hands. And it's about this guy that came home for the summer and he's going to live with his grandpa in, in this town. And, like, he's part of the poor side of town, the rich side of town. He meets this girl named, like, Skylar or something like that, or Sky. I don't remember what it was. And uh, she's like super ritzy rich, and he goes to like her house, and they're having this big pool party, and you know, the, my yacht. Um, and uh, the mom is sitting there, and she's like, "Oh, hello." And it turns out his grandpa's a Nazi. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the questions on the final exam for that book that we had to read was, "What was Sky's mom knitting at the pool when he showed up for the first time?" Now, I bet when I told you the intro to that story and kind of described it to you and what happened that I remember all the way back from freshman year of high school, um, you didn't think that I didn't read the book. And I did. I did, because otherwise I would not know the story unless I really remember those spark notes, baby. Um, but never in there were you wondering, what was she knitting, right? What's the significance of that? But I had to answer that question, and I got it wrong. Most of the class did. It was a golf club sock. Why did she ask that question? Why was that on the exam? Anybody answer that question for me? He couldn't. 
Why was that question on the exam? Yeah. Yeah, but why? Because she wanted to make sure that we read it. I read it. I got it wrong. And it made me think, this class is stupid. Not just that. You're stupid, Colmeyer. Kind of turned me off to the reading thing. I went on to not be turned off by reading. I actually won an English award for the high school. It was amazing. I didn't know those existed. I was down playing drums in the band room doing that thing. I used to be a part of this like crazy semi-professional marching band. And I spent all my time doing that. And then they're like, hey, you won an award. I'm like, what? Yeah, there's an awards night tonight. You need to go accept it. Okay. I'm like wearing like a tank top and like shorts. And I'm walking up on stage every wearing a suit. Here you go, the English award. What's that? <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know this existed. Bye. How does an English award person miss a question like that in an exam? Maybe these exams are more about compliance than they are about learning. Anyway, we're going to read a little bit today. Paul, are you there? Parker, are you there? I've got everybody else. If you want to follow along, I've got this on Google Classroom. You can also follow along right here. We're going to talk about some stuff. We're going to give you an idea of what geometry is. Maybe this is good, maybe it's bad. I don't know. I've never read this out loud to other students before. This is my first time. Reality and imagination. There are many realities out there. There is, of course, the physical reality we find ourselves in. Then there are those imaginary universes that resemble physical reality very closely, such as the one where everything was exactly the same, except I didn't pee my pants in the fifth grade. Anybody seen... Uh... Adam Sandler's movie, uh, Billy Madison. Oh, okay, well, we'll have to watch that. Or the one where that beautiful dark-haired girl on the bus turned to me, and we started talking and ended up falling in love. There are plenty of those kinds of imaginary realities, believe me. That's neither here nor there. I want to talk about a different sort of place. I'm going to call it mathematical reality. In my mind's eye, there is a universe where beautiful shapes and patterns float by and do curious and surprising things that keep me amused and entertained. It's an amazing place, and I really love it. The thing is, physical reality is a disaster. This was written before 2020. Little did he know. It's way too complicated. Nothing is... <laughs> Speaking of 2020. It's way too complicated. Nothing is at all what it appears to be. Objects expand and contract with temperature. Atoms fly on and off. In particular, nothing can truly be measured. A blade of grass has no actual length. That's a true statement. And it's not just because it's a blade of gla grass. None of us have any actual length. Any measurement made in this universe is necessarily a rough approximation. Not bad. It's just the nature of the place. The smallest speck is not a point, and the thinnest wire is not a line. Mathematical reality, on the other hand, is imaginary. It can be as simple and as pretty as I want it to be. I get to have all these perfect things I can't have in real life. I will never hold a circle in my hand. I can hold one in my mind. And I can measure it. Mathematical reality is a beautiful wonderland of my own creation. And I can explore it and think about it and talk about it with my friends. That's important in that last part. Now, there are lots of reasons people get interested in physical reality. Astronomers, biologists, chemists, and all the rest are trying to figure out how it works, how to describe it. I want to describe mathematical reality, to make patterns, to figure out how they work. That's what mathematicians like me try to do. The point is, I get to have them both, physical reality and mathematical reality. Both are beautiful and interesting, and somewhat frightening. The former is important to me because I am in it. The latter, because it is in me. I get to have both these wonderful things in my life, and so do you. My idea with this book is that we will design patterns. We'll make patterns of shape and motion, and then we will try to understand our patterns and measure them. And we will see beautiful things. But I won't lie to you, this is going to be very hard work. Mathematical reality is an infinite jungle full of enchanting mysteries, but the jungle does not give up its secrets easily. Be prepared to struggle both intellectually and creatively. The truth is, I don't know of any human activity as demanding of, of one's imagination, intuition, and ingenuity. But I do it anyway. I do it because I love it and because I can't help it. Once you've been to the jungle, you can never really leave. It haunts your waking dreams. So I invite you to go on an amazing adventure, and of course I want you to love the jungle and to fall under its spell. What I've tried to do in this book is to express how math feels to me, and to show you a few of our most beautiful and exciting discoveries. Don't expect any footnotes or references or anything scholarly like that. This is 
personal. I just hope I can manage to convey these deep and fascinating ideas in a way that is comprehensible and fun. Still expect it to be a little slow going. I have no desire to baby you or to protect you from the truth, and I am not going to apologize for how hard it is. Let it take hours or even days for a new idea to sink in. It may have originally taken centuries. I think that's something we forget about a lot. Math was developed over hundreds and hundreds of years. We expect you to learn all of it, more or less, up to the 1700s by the time you exit high school. I'm going to assume that you love beautiful things and are curious to learn about them. The only things you will need on this journey are common sense and simple human curiosity. But relax. Art is to be enjoyed. This is an art book. Math is not a race or a contest. Oh my god, it's not. Just you playing with your own imagination. Have a wonderful time. So far, I think he's made some good points. Math is not real. It's what we design it to be. It is how we make sense of the world, even when the world doesn't make sense. I'm going to talk about triangles in a little bit and why they're not real. Now, the smallest spec is not a point. And its wire is not a line. Math is art, first and foremost. You know, they say, oh, it's not an art, it's a science, right? It's not a science and art, right? Baking, right? It's science. You have to be exact. Get a little bit off, a little too much baking powder, all that. Throws everything off. Math is not that. It can be a science, but it is mostly an art. The art of creativity and thinking. When you do math, it's not because you decided to play by someone else's rules because someone else told you to. It's because you thought those rules would be interesting and useful in figuring out what you want to think about. When we teach English, we don't teach you these words to use out of a dictionary one by one. We don't want you to have a large vocabulary because these are the words we think are important to you. At least I hope we don't. We do it because we want you to be able to use the words and craft them in your own way, to state who you are, to be able to describe what you are. And someday make a difference with those same words. And that is what math is about as well. It is not to solve the problems that I present you, but to solve the problems that you want to solve, both for fun and for work. But I hope mostly for fun. Mathematics is the art. Any thoughts so far? Anybody? Anybody home on, uh, on the interweb? Have any thoughts? I made copies. Hi, everybody. Hello. No thoughts at all? Well, that's boring. Aren't you concerned that you have no thoughts? On problems, what is a math problem? To a ma mathematician, a problem is a probe, <laughs> a test of mathematical reality to see how it behaves. It is our way of poking it with a stick, which I will do in here with that thing, and seeing what happens. We have a piece of mathematical reality, which may be a configuration of shapes, a number pattern, what have you, and we want to understand what makes it tick. What does it do and why does it do it? We poke it only not with our hands and not with a stick. We have to poke it with our minds. As an example, let's say you've been playing around with triangles, chopping them up into other triangles and so forth, and you happen to make a discovery. When you connect each corner of a triangle to the middle of the opposite side, so corner to the middle of the opposite side, the three lines seem to meet all at one point. You try this for a wide variety of triangles and it always seems to happen. Now you have a mystery. But let's be very clear about exactly what the mystery is. It's not about your drawings or what looks like it's happening on paper. The question of what pencil and paper triangles may or may not do is a scientific one about physical reality. If you're drawing a sloppy, for example, then the lines won't meet. I suppose you can make an extremely careful drawing and put it under a microscope. Whoops. But you would learn a lot more about graphite and paper fibers than you would about triangles. The real mystery is about imaginary, too perfect to exist triangles. And the question is whether that these three perfect lines meet in a perfect point in mathematical reality. No pencils or microscopes will help you now. And just like Lockhart, I'm going to be telling you that a lot this year. You're going to draw a triangle and be like, look, my triangle does that. Well, great. What you drew is not a triangle. It is a physical version of a triangle, and it's not perfect. But how do we know if it really works that way? This is theater of the mind. Parker, I'll mark you here.
So how are we to address such a question? Can anything ever really be known about such imaginary objects? What form could such knowledge take? Before examining these issues, let's take a moment to simple, simply delight in the question itself and to appreciate what is being said here about nature of mathematical reality. What we've stumbled onto is a conspiracy. Apparently, there is some underlying and as yet unknown structural interplay going on that is making this happen. I think that is marvelous and also a little scary. What do triangles know that we don't? Sometimes it makes me a little queasy to think about all the beautiful and profound truths out there waiting to be discovered and connected together. What exactly is the mystery here? I, the mystery is why. Why would a triangle want to do such a thing? After all, if you drop three sticks at random, they usually don't meet in a point. They usually cross each other in different places to form a small triangle. Isn't that what we would expect to happen? If it was random, the odds are we'd end up with that, wouldn't we? You have to be very precise to have them all connect at one point. Do you agree? Are you seeing the point he's making? This is so perfect, how could it be random? What we are looking for is an explanation. Of course, one reason why an explanation may not be forthcoming is that it simply isn't true. It could not be true. That's always a possibility in this class. Don't forget that. My first rule that I usually teach people, and it's a little off this year because coronavirus and stuff, I'm doing things differently, is number one, trust no one. Trust no one. Don't trust me. The number of times in calculus that I did an entire problem on the board with the class, having them lead me, took the entire board. We got to the end. The answer was negative, and I said, why is it negative? Are we talking about a ladder going up a wall? Didn't the answer be positive? And they all groan, oh my god! But I let them write that, and I wrote it in my own hand. Do not trust me! You ever go to the supermarket, and you're like walking with somebody, and they think you're leading, and you think they're leading? The end of nowhere? That's going to be math class. I'm not leading. You are. Maybe we fooled ourselves by wishful thinking or clumsy drawing. There's a lot of fudging in physical reality. So maybe we just couldn't see the little triangle where the lines cross, right? You know, the one that looks all together like this. Maybe there is a tiny little triangle in there. It's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Perhaps it was so small that it got lost among all the smears and pencil crumbs. On the other hand, it's certainly the kind of thing that could be true. It has a lot of elements that mathematicians look for. Naturalness, elegance, simplicity, a certain inevitability qual inevitable quality. So it's probably true. Again, the question is why. We're not interested in whether it's true or not. The question is why is it true if it is? Anybody can say, do you think it's true or false, right? You get these questions all the time in your classes, right? I hated those questions. You know what I used to do? I'd do a T like this, and then I'd do a little line underneath it to make it look like I just did like a cool looking F. I just see what the teacher thought I wrote. Hated that. Shout out to Miss Hollemeyer. I'd always have a reason behind why I thought it was false that I couldn't explain. And so I get it marked wrong, and I go up to the teacher, and I explain why I thought her statement was false. And then she goes, oh yeah, I see it that way, that's fine. Here's my question. If that works, why didn't you ask for my opinion on the question instead of just true or false? You could have saved us a lot of time. Things are generally not binaries, true or false, in the real world. Oh no. Macy, if you want to read it on Google Class, it's on there, okay? And you can go back and watch the video later if you want to listen to me say it, okay? Do what you got to do. If you need to drop out, that's up to you. I won't hold it against you. Now, here's where the art comes in. In order to explain, we have to create something. You guys ever made a song? Ever written a poem? Ever written a book? What have you created? You ever created something? What'd you create, Brennan? Poem? For real? Something you're proud of? No? But you have done it. Gotcha. Yeah? I feel like younger kids are generally more creative than older kids. And I think it's because we beat it out of you. We don't practice it. Um, as a musician who's been in a bunch of bands, and I've, I've recorded a bunch of bands, um, my friend from Mozambique was over this weekend. He's uh, one of my former bandmates. He's a singer-songwriter, and I've mixed his music before. Um, and he's stuck right now. He can't. He doesn't feel like he has lyrics to put with some of the like music that he's been writing. And he just feels like, ah, I'll just leave it alone. But like, 
one of the key things you need to learn as an artist, and you all are artists in some way, there's all, always something you want to create. I think everybody is at some point. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my, my conjecture, that everybody's an artist in some way, whether it's you know physical art, music art, whatever, right? And math is art, I think. The key to making art is starting it and completing it. Not starting it and finishing it, because finishing it means it's done, it's complete, it's beautiful, right? I'm so proud of it. But making sure you start and end. And the hardest part is starting. My lyrics suck. Good. Write them down. They'll suck. And you can change them later. But now you have lyrics. Your math problem is art. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Great. Write down that you don't know what the hell you're doing and why. And change it over time. These songs that you listen to, this music that you love, this art that you see, was not made by a single brushstroke. It was made by many. And some of the ones way underneath the paint were ones that sucked. You have to put the pen to the paper. You have to put the brush on the canvas. You have to put the music out there. And it's going to be shitty. But that's part of the creative process. If you go out trying to make a hit album right off the bat, you're never going to make an album. You just have to make music. And that's how you need to treat math. you got to do it, man. Don't worry about the quality. We reflect on our work after we create it, not while we're doing it. If you start assessing your work while you're doing it, oh my God, anybody an artist in here? Anyone in art class? Yeah? You see every single pencil line as it comes out, right? Every single brush stroke. And the difference between you and your audience is that they see it when it's done. They can't see every single brush stroke. They just see the picture. You see every little part because you were there for its creation. You were there at its birth. And so your perspective is different than your audience. It doesn't mean it's wrong. But when you assess your work, do it when you're done, because that's how everybody else is going to Now here's where the art comes in. In order to explain, we have to create something. Namely, we need to somehow construct an argument, a piece of reasoning that will satisfy our curiosity, satisfy our curiosity as to why this behavior is happening. This is a very tall order. For one thing, it is not enough to draw or build a bunch of physical triangles and see that it more or less works for them. That is not an explanation. It's more of an approximate verification. You tested on a bunch of them, but do you test on every triangle? No. Maybe you got lucky. Ours is much more serious, uh, is a much more serious philosophical issue. Without knowing why the lines meet at a common point, how can we know that they actually do? In contrast to physical reality, there's nothing to observe. We can't just keep zooming in. How will we ever know anything about a purely imaginary realm? And that's what math is. The point is it doesn't matter so much what is true, it matters why it's true. The why is the what. Not that I'm trying to minimize the value of our ordinary senses. Far from it, we desperately need any and all aids to our intuition and imagination. Drawings, models, movies, whatever we can get. We just have to understand that ultimately these things are not really the subject of the conversation and cannot really tell us the truth about mathematical reality. So now we really are in a predicament. We have discovered what we may think to be a beautiful truth, and now we may need to prove it. This is what mathematicians do, and this is what I hope you will enjoy doing yourself. Is this such an extraordinary, diff extraordinarily difficult thing to do? Yes, it is. Is there some recipe or method to follow? No, there isn't. This is abstract art, pure and simple, and art is always a struggle. I'm going to say that again. Art is always a struggle. There is no systematic way to create beautiful and meaningful paintings or sculptures, and there is also no method for producing beautiful and meaningful mathematical arguments. Sorry. Math is the hardest thing there is, and that's one of the reasons I love it. I think he uses the word hard and difficult too much here. I saw a poster when I subbed for the first time in a math room. It said, life is hard, math is hard, get over it. And I tore it down on the first day. I was a sub. <laughs> Threw it in the trash can. Life is hard, math is hard, they can be. But we don't need to just get over it and deal with it and take it. Somebody else wants you to just take that shit. Don't take it. Do something. Same thing with math. Something. Don't accept life because someone else has it harder somewhere, somewhere else. Work for yourself a better life and everyone else around you. So no, I can't tell you how to do it, and I'm not going to hold your hand or give you a bunch of hints or solutions in the back of the book. If you want to paint a picture from your heart, there is no answer painting on the back of the canvas that you can look at. 
If you are working on a problem and are stuck and in pain, then welcome to the club. We mathematicians don't know how to solve our problems either. If we did, there would no longer be problems. We're always working at the edge of the unknown, and we're always stuck until we have a breakthrough. And I, and I hope you have many. An incredible feeling, but there is no special procedure for doing mathematics. There's no steps. If there's steps, it's not really math. You just have to think a lot and hope that inspiration comes to you. But I won't just drop you into the jungle and leave you there. Your intelligence and your curiosity you will have to supply yourself. These are your machete and your canteen. But maybe I can provide you with a compass in the form of a few general words of advice. The first is that the best problems are your own. You are the intrepid mental explorer. It's your mind, your adventure. Mathematical reality is yours. It's in your head for you to explore anytime you feel like it. There is no authority here other than you. What are your questions? Where do you want to go? I've enjoyed coming up with some problems for you to think about, but these are merely seeds. I planted to help you start growing your own jungle. Don't be afraid that you can't answer your own questions. That's the nat natural state of mathematicians. Also, try to always have five or six problems you are working on. It is very frustrating to keep banging your head against the wall over and over. This applies to other forms of art as well, like music. Always have multiple songs up in the air. It's much easier to have five or six walls to bang your head against, blah, blah, blah. Seriously, taking a break from a problem always seems to help. Take breaks. When I was in music school, I'd finally get the practice room at like midnight, and I'd practice for three hours so I'd get some practice in, because I'm there to learn music, right? I got all these other classes I got to do, right? Couldn't get the practice room because we were at a poor school and a crappy college. Should have never gone. Huge waste of money. Practicing for three hours is not as effective as practicing for one hour, taking a break for 30 minutes, and then practicing for another hour. Breaks are important. You have to reset your mind. That's how creativity works. It really is. If you're at home working on anything, especially math, don't be banging your head against the desk because you don't understand it. Stop. Don't hurt yourself. Take a break. It actually makes you smarter. If I could tell you that you could go play video games and get smarter at math, would you do it? Oh my god, you would! So I'm telling you that. Do that. It's not the only thing you have to do, but like you need to do that. Okay? Recreate. Another important piece of advice. Collaborate. Work together. If you have a friend who also wants to do math, you can work together and share the joys and frustrations. It's a lot like playing music together, see? Sometimes I'll spend six or eight hours working out a problem with a friend. Take breaks. And even we have accomplished next to nothing, we still had fun uh, feeling dumb together. Let it be hard. Try not to get discouraged or take your failures too personally. It's not only you that is having trouble understanding mathematical reality. It's all of us. It's us. Don't worry that you have no experience or that you're not qualified. What makes a mathematician is not technical skill or encyclopedic knowledge, but insatiable curiosity and a desire for simple beauty. Just be yourself and go where you want to go. Instead of being tentative and fearing failure or confusion, Try to embrace the awe and mystery of it all, and joyfully make a mess. Yes, your ideas won't work. Yes, your intuition will be flawed. Again, welcome to the club. I have a dozen bad ideas a day, and so does every other mathematician. Now, I know what you're thinking. A bunch of fuzzy, romantic talk about beauty and art and the exquisite pain of creativity is all very well and good, but how on earth am I supposed to do this? I've never created a mathematical argument in my life. Can't you give me a little more to go on? Let's go back to our triangle in the three lines. How can we begin to cobble together some sort of an argument? One place we might start is by looking at a symmetrical triangle, so a specific type of triangle. It's not going to prove it for all triangles, but it's going to prove it for this triangle. This kind of triangle is also called equilateral. Latin, equa, meaning equal. That's where we get our word from. Lateral. You guys play football? Lateral pass? Side pass, right? Side. So equal sides. I like Latin. No one has to tell you what equilateral means if you understand what equal and lateral mean. It all builds upon itself. English has a bunch of new words. Kumquat. Break that apart. Don't. That's not what it means. Now, I know this is an absurdly atypical situation, but the idea is that if we can somehow explain why the lines meet in the special case, it might give us a clue about how to proceed with a more general triangle. Or might, it might not. You never know. You just have to mess around what we mathematicians like to call doing research. In any event, we have to start somewhere, and it should at least be easier to figure out something in this case. Starting helps. What we have going for us in the special situation is tons of symmetry. Do not ignore symmetries. In many ways, it is our most powerful mathematical tool. 
Here's symmet here symmetry allows us to conclude that anything that happens on one side must also happen on the other. You guys know what symmetry is, right, from our class, right? Really beautiful people, they say, have like symmetrical faces, right? If you flip the, the image of their face over, it looks like the other side. Right? Very discouraging, someone who looks such as me. Again, 10,000 views and I will do a face reveal. Another way to say this is that if we flip the triangle across its line of symmetry, it would look exactly the same. Cool, cool, cool. There's a line of symmetry. How do we know that? Because if we were to fold it across that line or flip it across, it would be the same on both sides. In particular, the midpoints, the middle points of the two sides would switch places, as with the lines connecting them to their opposite corners. So if we were to fold this, that midpoint, the midpoint of this side would flip over onto this midpoint. So these lines that would also flip over onto each other. Does that make sense? This line right here would flip to this line. As we folded it, can you imagine that? Could we get out a piece of paper and show it? Sure, that's fine, and you can if you want. Uh, if you want, but imagining it is important. Can't do that. Get it out and then try to imagine it. After you, okay? We need to build up our imaginations in here. We know we've been killing them the rest of the school, school day. But this means that the crossing point of these two lines can't be on one side of the line of symmetry. So that crossing point where they cross has to be in the middle. Because if they crossed on just one side, that cross would flip, this dot right here would flip over to this side, wouldn't it? And that wouldn't be symmetrical. You see what I'm saying? The only way that dot can be symmetrical is if it's on the line of symmetry. We get something like this. And that can't be true, because we know those lines are supposed to match up onto each other, right? They have to. So the crossing point must actually be on the line of symmetry. Clearly, our third line, this one right here, is simply the line of symmetry itself. It's going to go to the midpoint because this thing needs to flip on itself when we fold, right? And if this was over here, it would flip over to there, right? If this connected here and we folded it, it'd flip over to there, wouldn't it? It has to be here. Well, if this is on the line of symmetry and this is the line of symmetry, all three must connect. Are you smelling what I'm stepping in? These words are hard. I'm speaking quickly. Are you smelling what I'm stepping in here? Are you following the logic of this? I don't want to know, do you understand? Because everyone's going, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Whatever. I want to know, does it make sense? Trust no one. What I'm telling you might be false. If you're afraid of looking like a dummy, don't always answer yes. Does it make sense that the two lines here have to be connect, uh, centered on this symmetry line? They have to intersect it. If they didn't, they'd flip over and it wouldn't be symmetrical, right? We said we had a symmetrical triangle. Does it make sense the line of symmetry has to reflect onto itself as well if we're folding on that line? So if the line of symmetry is on the line of symmetry and the two other lines intersect in the line of symmetry, the point where they intersect must be somewhere in the middle, all three. This is an example of a mathematical argument, otherwise known as a proof. Bum, bum, bum! A proof is simply a story. It's narrative. There's a beginning, there's an end, there's something that happens. The climax. The characters are the elements of the problem, and the plot is up to you. The goal, as in any literary fiction, I know you don't like fiction, okay? And you like history. Kind of both. Is to write a story that is compelling as a narrative. Compelling! Mathematics, compelling. Man, have we sucked at that for over the years. You should not. In, ca in the case of mathematics, this means that the plot no not only has to make logical sense, but also be simple and elegant. No one likes a meandering, complicated quagmire of a proof. Giggity. We want to follow along rationally, but to be sure. But we also want to be charmed and swept off our feet aesthetically. A proof should be lovely as well as logical. What I want you guys to do is if you want... Read some more of this. I don't want to say read the rest of it. We ended on page 12. It's on Google Classroom. Do or do not. I don't care. But if it spoke to you, check out the rest. This is geometry. There are two versions. The typical version is definitions to class. Here's your notebook. Memorize all your crap. See you for the test. It's the worst of math when it comes to that. Or option B, it can be this. If we're going to do it, God damn it, I have to beat you. I'm paid to do it. I have to beat you. Let's do it option B. Have a good rest of your day. I'll see you guys two days from now. A boy?
Okay, well that would be a reason then, okay, wouldn't well, it? Okay, it's not really a reason, I just kind of do it. Really? Huh, that's so intriguing. So when did you go to a British school? I bet it was when you were in Britain. Oh, uh, I was in Germany. Intrigue. Okay, can we not? Okay, yeah, we can not. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I just don't want to... Jerica says I'll get paid fun. Jerica? Yeah. You're friends with Jerica? Yeah. Honey, you can do better. I know, I can. Okay. What do you say? That's right. Uh oh. My pages are getting out of order. That's not good. Friends with Jericho. Okay, well, I have more to say about that. But I won't. Okay. I mean, I feel like there has to be better options. I mean, it's Morrison. There's not a lot, but still. You were supposed to do something? No. Parker, I'm going to mark you here. Um, no, your weekends are yours. And you're never required to really do anything in this class other than make sure that, but like, like, it is your job to make sure you can show up for the portfolio meeting, which will be next Wednesday for those of you that already met with me. And for those that have not met with me, it'll be um, for you guys Thursday this week. Okay? We're going to try and squeeze that in. If we can't, we'll have to do it outside class. I'm sorry. Um, but that's the goal. Young goofs are you got to squeeze it. Hopefully we'll have time. Um, so you never have to do anything. It's just when you show up on Portfolio Day, you have to be accounted for for what you did. Judgment Day. Anyway. Be able to say, look, this is what I did, and here's why I think it deserves an A. Awesome. Weston is here. Haley is here. Jace is here. All right, so Blake is here, Olivia's here, Campbell is here, Corinne is here, Theron is here, Sheon is here, Annie's here, Marissa's here, Katie's here, Loralee's here, Mika is here, Jaden is here. Uh, I see Jace, I see Haley, I see Weston, Ethan, and McCartney. Donde esta? And then we're going to begin. If you want to follow along at home in your hymnal, uh, it's, on Google, it's in Google Classroom. Go to Classwork, and there should be something about Paul Lockhart. Um, uh, excerpt from measurement. If you want to follow along there? I'll also be reading it here. Um, this is, uh, for most of the class, you can just not put me on mute, but you can just listen if you want. I'm going to be doing a uh, 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 slam poetry. Okay. You can say it better than Paul. And he uses the word P in his first paragraph. That's how you get attention. I'll tell you the story someday about the First disc I ever gave was the tension getter I used. Oh man, long time. Back to you. Trainers here, awesome. McCartney, if you're here, let me know. Okay. I have a banana. Sorry. It's been embarrassing when you like have a YouTube tab open and it plays. Just kidding. That was a TikTok from Katie Egemeyer. Or when she's in like sixth grade. Join Discord. It's weird. Did y'all have a good Labor Day? Did anyone else almost catch their deck on fire? Gotcha. This weekend? Yeah, yeah. It was fun. Oh, whoa. How did you put it out? Okay, so it didn't actually catch on fire. So mine did catch on fire, I suppose. Oh. That was misleading. Um, but it's, it's the second time since I moved in in July to this new apartment that I've gotten to use the fire thing. I'm really good at it now. <laughs> Real good. First time my oven caught on fire. But that wasn't my fault. It's because it was like 30 years old. It's older than I am. And uh, there's grease down the back of it, and they never actually cleaned the place, even though I paid $238 to move it. 
but uh potato potato I, I don't know how that applies to this okay i'm gonna read to you from from uh paul lockhart he's a mathematician and an author and i think the way he goes about explaining geometry is better than i ever could so i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little slam poetry reading of it um if you want to follow along in the scripture up there or on your chromebooks or you know listen to this later i you do you Again, for people just checking in, um, if you didn't meet with me, uh, uh, Ethan, I'm talking to you. If you did not meet to me uh, with your portfolio last week, you're going to be doing it this week, either Thursday or Friday, depending on what day you're here. We're going to try to squeeze that at the end of class. If we can't, that's not my problem. That's your problem because you screwed up last week. Sorry about you. Um, Marissa, not your fault. Everybody else's fault. You are the only one that I will prioritize. Um, everybody else will be doing it on Wednesday next week and kind of keep that pattern going. I don't know how most of your teachers are running class, but some of you I know are just like checking in for a couple minutes on Wednesday and then they give you a homework assignment and that's learning. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a sign up sheet out for Wednesdays and when you wanna do your portfolio review with me. If you're like, crap, all my classes make me watch the whole time and I hate it, sorry, um, but you can sign up during this class period, right? And that'll work out. For others of you that are like, it, is, it should be illegal to do math before nine o'clock, um, you can sign up for a different time. Is that cool? Rad. Fantastic. The things I've seen have been really good. I encourage you to go read other comments um, that I've left because, not to, not to brag, but my comments are pretty good. And so it can help you make comments on stuff in the future. Right? I have a kind of a pattern to it, right? How you might go further with the problem, right? How you might, you know, whatever. Um, feel that kind of template of how I do things for comments and try to leave comments like that on your own. Because eventually I want to transfer it over where I'm doing less and less of the commenting and you're doing more. Okay, and that's important. Otherwise, if there's no comments, you won't move forward with your work, and everybody's grades will suck. And I know you guys all care about that grade. Oh, your learning will not be as good. Anyway, are you ready? Are you stoked? Um, everyone, uh, don't turn your attention to Shion. Uh, no, 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 no. You do you. Okay, she's been in this class before. If you are exhausted and cannot learn, please put your head down and go to sleep. Okay? Pick it up in the next class. If you can't learn, and you are the judge of that, you know you better than I'll ever know you. You can't learn because you're too tired, too hungry, whatever, right? You're stressed. Do what you need to do to be ready for your next class, or be ready for the next day, or be ready for the next week, whatever it is. Because if you don't take care of yourself, we're not doing anybody favors. I'm not going to pick up a desk, you know, you know, my old teacher used to pick up the corner of the desk and drop it when you're up to shake or you know drop a book on the floor or, you know be obnoxious and that's fun but it's also like doesn't help and i like screwing around and being fun but helping anyway reality and imagination there are many realities out there there's of course the physical reality we find ourselves in then there are those imaginary universe, uh, universes that resemble physical reality very closely, such as the one where everything is exactly the same except I didn't pee my pants in the fifth grade. Shout out to Billy Madison, you ever seen the movie? Uh, or the one where a beautiful heart, uh, dark haired girl on the bus turned to me and we ta started talking and ended up falling in love. There are plenty of those kinds of imaginary realities, believe me. That's neither here nor there. I want to talk about a different sort of place. I'm going to call it mathematical reality. In my mind's eye, there is a universe where beautiful shapes and patterns float by and do curious and surprising things that keep me amused and entertained. It is an amazing place, and I really love it. The thing is, physical reality is a disaster. This is written before 2020. Little did he know. It's way too complicated. Nothing is at all what it appears to be. Objects expand and contract with temperatures. Atoms fly on and off. In particular, nothing can be measured. A blade of grass has no actual length. Any measurement made in this universe, including measurements of yourself, is necessarily a rough approximation. I could be six foot two, guys. It's not bad. It's just the nature of the place. The smallest speck is not a point. The thinnest wire is not a line. Mathematical reality, on the other hand, is imaginary. It can be as simple and pretty as I want it to be. I get to have all those perfect things I can't have in real life. I will never hold a circle in my hand, but I can hold one in my mind, and I can measure it. Mathematical reality is a beautiful wonderland of my own creation, and I can explore it and think about it and talk about it with my friends, if you have them. 
Maybe they're imaginary too. Bubble Buddy. Now there are lots of reasons people get interested in physical reality. Astronomers, biologists, chemists, and all the rest are trying to figure out how it works. How to describe it. I want to describe mathematical reality to make patterns, to figure out how they work. That's what mathematicians like me try to do. The point is I get to have them both. Physical reality and mathematical reality. Both are beautiful and interesting and somewhat frightening. The former is important to me because I am in it. The latter because it is in me. I get to have both these wonderful things in my life, and so do you. My idea with this book is that we all design patterns. We'll make patterns of shape and motion, and then we will try to understand our patterns and measure them. And we will see beautiful things. But I won't lie to you, this is going to be very hard work. Mathematical reality is an infinite jungle full of enchanting mysteries, but the jungle does not give up its secrets easily. Be prepared to struggle both intellectually and creatively, especially creatively. The truth is, I don't know of any human activity as demanding of one's imagination, intuition, and ingenuity. But I do it anyway. I do it because I love it and because I can't help it. Once you've been to the jungle, you can never really leave. It haunts your waking dreams. So I invite you to go on an amazing adventure. Of course, I want you to love the jungle and fall under its spell. What I've tried to do in this book is to express how math feels to me. When's the last time you thought about how math feels? to show you a few of our most beautiful and exciting discoveries. Don't expect any footnotes or references or anything scholarly like that. This is personal. I just hope I can manage to convey these deep and fascinating ideas in a way that is comprehensive, comprehensible and fun. Still expect it to be slow going. I have no desire to baby you or to protect you from the truth. I'm not going to apologize for how hard it is. Let it take hours or even days for a new idea to sink. It may have originally taken centuries. That's a really good point. We expect you by the end of high school to know pretty much all of mathematics since the beginning of math to the 1700s. By the end of high school. It took hundreds and hundreds of years to develop. Crazy. How do we expect people to do that? Wild to me. And on the other hand, if we're stopping at the 1700s, there's really not that much to, to do that within high school. Why do we stop at the 1700s? Hasn't anything happened in the last 300 years? Can you think of anything that's different in the last 300 years? From 1700? 1700 was before 1776, which was the birth of America, as we call it. I mean, America existed before. There were native people here that we slaughtered and killed. You know, white America. Well, I guess that's something. We expect you to master it all by the end of high school. Isn't that wild? I'm going to assume you love beautiful things and are curious to learn about them. The only things you will need on this journey are common sense and simple human curiosity. Relax. Art is to be enjoyed. And it is art. Math is not a race or a contest. It's just you playing with your own imagination. Have a wonderful time. Thoughts? Do you have any? P H O U G H T E S. No? Yes? Maybe? Before we go any further, I want to tell you my first rule in this class, and I think I said it last year. I don't know, it's been a weird last two years. Rule number one trust no one. Trust no one. I can't tell you the number of times I taught calculus, filled up an entire board with a problem that we were working on, the kids were leading, and I was writing it down. We got to the end, someone goes, wait a minute, aren't we talking about a ladder falling? Shouldn't the answer be negative? And everyone goes, oh, we made a mistake. We just spent an hour on this. I will write what you tell me to write. I will follow your logic if you say it's logical. You ever been to the supermarket or somewhere where you're with another person and they think you're leading and you think they're leading and you just kind of walk around and then you realize no one was leading? Don't be surprised when no one is leading. Not me, you. You're in charge. Trust no one. On problems. What is a math problem? To a mathematician, a problem is a probe. <laughs> a test of mathematical reality to see how it behaves. It is our way of poking it with a stick. That's why I have that one. And seeing what happens. We have a piece of mathematical reality, which may be a configuration of shapes, a number pattern, or what have you. We want to understand what makes it tick. What does it do? And why does it do it? We poke it. 
Only not with our hands and not with a stick. We have to poke it with our minds. As an example, let's say you've been playing around with triangles. Because that's something you do, you freaking nerd. Chopping them up into other triangles and so forth, and you happen to make a discovery. When you connect each corner of a triangle to the middle of the opposite side, so corner to the middle, corner to the middle, corner to the middle, the three lines seem to meet at a point. You try this for a wide variety of triangles. Are you quite finished? And it always seems to happen. Now you have a mystery! But let's be very clear about exactly what the mystery is. It's not about your drawing or what looks like is happening on paper. The question of what pencil and paper triangles may or may not do is a scientific one about physical reality. For instance, if you're drawing a sloppy, for example, the lines won't meet, right? I suppose you could make an extremely careful drawing and put it under a microscope. But you would learn a lot more about graphite and paper fibers than you would about triangles. Guys, triangles aren't real. They don't exist in the real world. Neither do circles. Neither do numbers. This is all imaginary. That might be shocking, but it's true. The real mystery is about imaginary, too perfect to exist triangles. And the question is whether these three perfect lines meet in a perfect point in mathematical reality. No pencils or microscopes will help you now. I'm going to be reminding you guys of that a lot this year. You're going to be drawing it, and you're like, look, my drawing does that. That's a proof. No, it's not. You proved it for one triangle that may or might not be a perfect triangle. Maybe you goofed it, right? But you prove it for all triangles? How are you going to do that, right? At the end of the day, we can only do this in our imagination. We cannot use rulers. We cannot use any of that stuff. So how do we do this? Can anything ever really be known about such imaginary objects? What form could such knowledge take? Before examining these issues, let's make, take a moment to simply delight in the question itself and to appreciate what is being said here about the nature of mathematical reality. What we've stumbled upon is a conspiracy. Apparently there is some underlying and as yet unknown structural interplay going on that is making this happen. I think that is marvelous and also a little scary. What do triangles know that we don't? Sometimes it makes me a little queasy to think about all the beautiful and profound truths out there waiting to be discovered and connected together. What exactly is the mystery here? Hi. The mystery is why. Why would a triangle want to do such a thing? After all, if you drop three sticks at random, they usually don't meet at a point. They cross each other in three different places to form tiny little triangles. Right? Drop three sticks. You're more likely to get that than have them all meet exactly at a point, right? You see what I'm saying here? Again, trust no one. If this doesn't make sense to you, maybe it's because what I'm telling you isn't true. You're worried about looking dumb, and that's why you're going, yeah, yeah, I understand. That's a good way to look dumb. Be honest. You drop three sticks, odds are you're going to get something like that. Not perfectly all together, right? You're going to end up like this. What were you looking for is an explanation. Of course, one reason why an explanation may not be forthcoming is that it simply isn't true. That always happens. People forget about that all the time. It could all be a lie. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe we fool ourselves by wishfully thinking or clumsy drawing. There's a lot of fudging heh, in physical reality. So maybe we just couldn't see the little triangles where the lines cross. Or maybe there's like a tiny little triangle over here. Could be. Right? Perhaps it was so small that it got lost among all the smears and pencil crumbs. On the other hand, it's certainly the kind of thing that could be true. Right? It's not impossible to think of all three intersecting at one spot. Right? Could happen. It has a lot of elements that mathematicians look for. It has naturalness, elegance, simplicity, and a certain inevitable quality, right? Eventually, they're going to all land in the same spot if you drop them enough, right? You'd think so. That's probably true, but again, the question is why? We are not interested in what is true and what is not, okay? Turns out the thing we believe is false, great, fantastic. We are interested in why is it true, because that's where the magic lies. That's where the interesting parts lie. And even if it ends up being false, we find out something, you know, good about our argument. Now here's where the art comes in. In order to explain, we have to create something. Anybody created something in here? A poem, music, a piece of writing, a movie, like anything, a, a, a new kind of ketchup, a hybrid animal. You never created anything? I find that when I taught kindergarten, that they're more creative 
first grade. First graders are more creative than second graders, and second graders are more creative than third graders, and fourth graders are a hell of a lot more creative than high school. And the only thing that's really happened to them between kindergarten and high school is they've gone to school. They've gotten educated. I think we kick the creativity out of them. We don't practice it. We discourage it. There are creative people and there are non-creative people. And most of us are non-creative. That's bullshit. You all have an imagination. We kill it. You're going to need that. I'm sorry that we've killed it and now you need it. It's a very rough transition into geometry. Because of that. But it's an important one. If it was up to me, we wouldn't kill it on the way. Working on it. Sorry. This is art, not as much as science, biology, a creative endeavor. Um, a friend of mine came home from Mozambique recently. He's a former band member of mine. I used to record a bunch of artists, do all kinds of things, so I recorded his music. He's in a creative rut right now. He has some music that he's written, but he doesn't have lyrics for it, and so he's just not doing anything with it. We were talking about it. He's like, yeah, the lyrics, I just don't have anything to put to it, so I'm just not creating anything right now. And one of the worst things you can do when you're trying to make a song to not start making it. Yeah, lyrics might suck, but write them down because later you can go back and change them. To make art, you have to start making art. If you try to make a hit album or a hit song for your first song, you're going to have a really bad time. You need to make lots and lots of crappy art. And the key is, is you don't reflect on the quality of it as you're making it. As you're drawing, don't look at the quality as you're doing it. Right, try to make it a good drawing, right? Do your best, but don't like assess it every five seconds and look, oh, that looks ugly. No, keep going. Keep going. If you're in an art class, you know what I'm talking about. You see every single pencil line as it is created. You are there for the birth of that universe. You know it intimately. And your audience only sees the final result. They can't see every single line. Paintings have tons of paint underneath them that has been painted over that you'll never see. But the artist knows is there. It affects their understanding of the piece. Same thing with math. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Math is not done. There it is. It's perfect. It's great. It's never done that way. Ever. By anybody. You have to... Start it, and you don't know what the hell you're doing, but that's okay. That's what it's supposed to be like. But the more you go out there and venture into that void, the better you'll get it now. you got to do it. That's how you make art. You do it. How do you make good art? You continue to do it. Same thing with math. In order to explain something, we have to create something. Namely, we need to show... Uh, to somehow construct an argument, a piece of reasoning that will satisfy our curiosity, not mine, not theirs, yours. Our curiosity as to why this behavior is happening. This is a very tall order. For one thing, it's not enough to draw or build a bunch of physical triangles and see that it more or less works for them, right? It works for 20 of them, it works for 100 of them, it might work for all of them. It doesn't work that way. That is not an explanation, it's more of an approximate verification. It seems like it should work. Ours is a much more serious philosophical issue. Without knowing what the lines meet at a common point, how can we know that they actually do? In contrast with physical reality, there's nothing to observe. There's no measurement to be made. How will we ever know something about a purely imaginary realm? The point is, it doesn't matter so much what is true, it matters why it's true. The why is the what. Not that I'm trying to minimize the value of our ordinary senses. Far from it. We desperately need any and all aids to our intuition and imagination. Drawings, models, movies, whatever. We just have to understand that ultimately that these things are not really the subject of the conversation and cannot really tell us the truth about mathematical reality. So now we really are in a predicament. We have discovered what we think may be a beautiful truth. And now we need to prove it. And why is this beautiful, right? Who cares? The lines intersect at a point. Big deal. It's not what that is interesting. Hey, did you know if you draw lines in a triangle in this certain way, they'll all intersect a point? No one gives a shit, okay? No one does. And if you do, God bless you. Maybe you'll be a math teacher. Please, no. You, you could do better. Okay, you can do a lot. Um, it's why they're true that it's interesting. The way to prove that. That's what makes it interesting. 
we've discovered what we think may be a beautiful truth. Now we need to prove it. This is what mathematicians do, and this is what I hope you will enjoy doing yourself. If, oh, sorry, is this such an extraordinarily difficult thing to do? Yes, it is. Is there some recipe or method to follow? No, there isn't. This is abstract art, pure and simple. And art is always a struggle. I'm going to say that again. Art is always a struggle. I don't think it's hard necessarily. I saw this poster when I first started subbing math, right? Just a sub. I walk into a room and I see this poster and it says, Life is hard. Math is hard. Get over it. I tore this thing down. What an awful way to walk into a classroom as a teacher or a kid and see that life is hard, math is hard, and you're just going to get over it. I hear this all too often, especially the life is hard thing. Your life sucks, but guess what? There are people somewhere else that have it way worse, so get over it. And that's how we all end up with really crappy lives. Because you don't do anything about it, and they can't do anything about it, and the people above you don't do anything about it because you've got it worse than them. Change the world. I don't know when this became so controversial. Do it. Art is always a struggle. There is no systematic way to create beautiful and meaningful paintings or sculptures, and there is also no method for producing beautiful and meaningful mathematical arguments. Sorry. Math is the hardest thing there is, and I don't mean that as in like, life is hard. Just challenging, not easy. And that's one of the reasons I love it. It was easy, who cares? Not easy to change the world, hard to change the world, but it is definitely a good thing to do. So now I can't tell you how to do it, and I'm not going to hold your hand or give you a bunch of hints or solutions in the back of the book. If you want to paint a picture from your heart, there is no answer painting on the back of the canvas. There's no back of the book to that, right? If you're working on a problem and you're stuck and in pain, then welcome to the club. We mathematicians don't know how to solve our problems either. If we did, they would no longer be problems. We're always working at the edge of the unknown, and we're always stuck until we have a breakthrough. And I hope you have many. It's an incredible feeling. But there's no special procedure for doing math. There's no steps. You just have to think a lot and hope that inspiration comes to you. But I won't just drop you into the jungle and leave you there. Your intelligence and curiosity will have to, to supply, you will have to supply them yourself. These are your machete and your canteen. But maybe I can provide you with a compass in the form of a few general words of advice. And here they are. The first is that the best problems are your own. They don't come from me. They're yours. And if they do come from me, you can adopt them and make them your own. But they have to be your own. If you don't care, it's not a good problem. That's the reality. If I write x squared plus 5 equals 7 on the board and no one cares, it's not a good problem. My job is to convince you to care. And if you don't, that's okay. You're right. You know you better than I'll ever know you. If you need to sleep, you should. That's not a, that's not a jab. You know you. You are the intrepid mental explorer. It's your mind and your adventure. Mathematical reality is yours. It's in your head for you to explore anytime you feel like it. And no more. What are your questions? Where do you want to go? I've enjoyed coming up with some problems for you to think about, but these are merely seeds. I've planted to help you start growing your own jungle. Don't be afraid that you can't answer your own questions. That's the natural state of mathematicians. Not knowing is how we are most of the time. Also, try to always have five or six problems you're working on. Same thing with songs or paintings. It's always good to have a bunch of balls up in the air, right? Also, try to always have five or six problems to work on. It is very frustrating to keep banging your head against the same wall over and over. Seriously, taking a break from a problem always seems up. When I was in college, I'd wait until like midnight for the practice room to finally be open so I could practice music, because that's why I was there. Really crappy college. Had very few practice rooms. The majority of the day was taken up by a professor teaching private lessons because she was paid so little by the college that in order to make ends meet to take care of her sick mother, she had to teach private lessons all day long, which took the, the, uh, the room from us, and we couldn't practice until midnight. Now, the music hall closed at 11. That didn't stop you, boy. Okay? You hide under bleachers. You hide in closets. You play Don't Get Caught by Security. Then you go down there and start playing drums, marimba and xylophone, and all kinds of other stuff once they've gone. But you got to be careful, right? I did get caught. 
The point is, when I was there at midnight, I practiced for like three hours straight because, man, I want to get to bed as soon as possible. I'm exhausted. I got class at 8 in the morning. <laughs> do not do class. No one should be learning anything but for um, including for you guys, especially. It would be illegal to be. Um, anyway, it's much better to practice for an hour, take a 30-minute break, and then practice for another hour than it is to practice for three hours. It just is. Your brain actually works better. If I told you that you would get better at math by playing video games or whatever it is, you would do it, right? You'd be like, oh, my God, that would be great. What are you doing, Mom? Studying. Bam, 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 bam. 360 no-scope, right? Math. But it's true. You need to take a break and do other things to do math because that's how creativity works. That's how our brains work. Don't sit there doing homework late at night. Not going to do it in my class, but do it in any other class. Don't do that. And banging your head against the table. Stop. Get some help. Listen to Michael Jordan. You know that meme? No? Okay. Another important piece of advice. Collaborate! If you have a friend, that's a big if, who also wants to do math, as long as they're not Jerrica. You can work together and share the joys and frustrations. It's a lot like playing music together. Sometimes I'll spend six or eight hours with breaks, working on a problem with a friend, and even if we accomplish next to nothing, we still had fun feeling dumb together. You ever had fun being dumb with your friends? That's math. So let it be hard. Try not to get discouraged or take your failures too personally. And not, not only you that is having trouble understanding mathematical reality, it's all of us. It's not you, it's us. Always us. It's a collaborative endeavor. We do math together, never alone. You never walk alone. Don't worry that you have no experience or that you're not qualified. What makes a mathematician is not technical skill or encyclopedic knowledge, but insatiable curiosity and a desire for simple beauty. Just be yourself and go where you want to go. Instead of being tentative and fearful, failure, uh, fearing failure or confusion, try to embrace the awe and mystery of it all and joyfully make a mess. Make a mess. Yes, your ideas won't work. Yes, your intuition will be flawed. Again, welcome to the club. I have a dozen bad ideas a day. And so does every other mathematician. Now I know what you're thinking. A bunch of fuzzy, romantic talk about beauty and art and the exquisite pain of creativity is all very well and good, but how on earth am I supposed to do this thing? I've never created a mathematical argument in my life. Can't you give me a little more to go on? Let's go back to our triangle in the three lines. How can we begin to cobble together some sort of an argument? One place we could start at is by looking at a symmetrical triangle. Ah, symmetry. You know how they talk about like beautiful people have symmetrical faces? You can like fold them on yourself. Yeah, that's bad news for you, boy. This kind of triangle is also called equilateral. I love Latin because unlike English, you can look at the words and understand what it means. Someone doesn't have to tell you, right? If I say kumquat, if you don't know what that is, you have to figure out from me what it is. You can't break the word apart and figure out what it means. Trust me, you don't want to do that. Equilateral, equa, equal. Lateral, you, football, lateral pass. The side pass, right? Lateral means side, so equal sides, equal si same sides, equal sides. That's what equilateral means. Latin is great. Now, I know this is an absurdly atypical situation, but the idea is that if we can somehow explain why the lines meet in this special case, it might give us a clue about how to proceed with more gen a more general triangle, right? This is a specific triangle. We can prove it for this triangle. Does it mean we prove it for all the others? No, but it might give us some insight. The problem of proving it for all triangles is really big. We find a similar and related problem that may be a little bit easier, right? And see what we can learn from that and see if we can expand it to the bigger one. Or it might not. You never know. You just have to me mess around what we mathematicians like to call doing research. That's what you're doing in your portfolios. In any event, you have to start somewhere, and it should at least be easier to figure out something in this case. What we have going on for us in this spe uh, special situation is tons of symmetry. Do not ignore symmetry. In many ways, it is our most powerful mathematical tool. Here, symmetry allows us to conclude that anything happens on one side of the triangle must also happen on the other, right? If my eye is here and it's symmetrical to this eye, it's going to happen on both sides, right? That's why I got two of them. Another way to say this is that if we flip the triangle across its line of symmetry, it would look exactly the same. So if there was, like, an imperfection over here, in order to be similar, it would have to have the same imperfection on the other side. Smell what I'm stepping in? Yeah, for real? If you don't, be honest. Okay. Cross no one. In particular, the midpoints of the two sides would switch places, as with the lines connecting them to their opposite corners. So these are the midpoints, right? The middle of this side is here, and the middle of this side is here. And if we were to flip it, that would line up with this, yeah? And this line would line up with this line. Can you imagine that in your head? Kind of weird, because this moves over to there, this part moves over to there, and this part moves over to there. They fold onto each other. 
That's symmetry, okay? But this means that the crossing point of these two lines can't be on one side of the line of symmetry. See how this one's sort of to the right of it? It can't be there. Why? Because if these lines perfectly map onto each other, if it was to the side, that point would end up here, wouldn't it? It wouldn't map onto it. And we said we had a sym sym symmetrical triangle, right? We said right from the beginning, it has to be symmetrical. So if the point of intersection wasn't in the middle, it'd end up over there and it would break our first rule that it's symmetrical, right? Are you following me there? We'd get something like this. It wouldn't be symmetrical, so we wouldn't be talking about the triangle we imagined. So the crossing point must be actually on the line of symmetry. It must be here where they cross. Clearly our third line is the line of symmetry. So if the line of symmetry is on the line of symmetry, I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It's going to be on itself. And the other two lines intersect on the line of symmetry, then all three must intersect in the middle. They must intersect like this in a symmetrical triangle. This is an example of a mathematical argument, otherwise known as a proof. Bum, bum, bum. A proof is simply a story. It's a narrative. There's plot, beginning, rising action, climax. The characters are the elements of the problem, and the plot is up to you. The goal, as in any literary fiction, is to write a story that is compelling as a narrative. Math that is compelling. When's the last time you've been compelled by a math class? That's what math is, and we show you this thing, and we call it math, and we make you guys think it's garbage. And maybe it is, but we're not doing it any favors. In the case of mathematics, this means that the plot not only has to make logical sense, but also be simple and elegant. No one likes a meandering, complicated quagmire, giggity, of a proof. We want to follow along rationally, to be sure, but we also want to be charmed and swept off our feet aesthetically. A proof should be lovely as well as logical. Hi, Grace. Which brings me to another piece of advice. Improve your proofs. Just because you have an explanation doesn't mean it's the best explanation. Can you eliminate any unnecessary clutter or complexity? Can you find an entirely different approach that gives you a deeper insight? Prove, prove, and prove again. Painters, sculptures, and poets do the same thing. One might argue that Leonardo created a beautiful sculpture, perhaps a perfect one, but that did not stop him there. If you are so inclined, this is on Google Classroom, I would encourage you to read it. If you're not so inclined, don't. Spray down your desks, compadres. If you're reading from our hymnal today, if you want to get on Google Class and follow along, or just follow along with the words up there, you're more than welcome. Hope you all had a great Labor Day weekend and did zero labor. Anybody else almost catch their deck on fire? Correct. Anybody else catch their deck on fire like I did? Okay. <coughs> yes, sir. I made paella, and then after I disposed of the coals, I poured water in them and put them in a. Uh, I, I moved them over by hand. Oh, cooking. Oh, it's delicious. Um, it was the after part that uh, burned me. Uh, uh, I moved the coals into a plastic container by hand. They were hot, and then dumped water on them. Tons of water. There's water in the bottom of the container when I put them in there. Three hours later, they got fire. <laughs> yeah, I put the stuff out in the boys' There's even dirt in there. So, uh, needless to say, I'm happy that it's raining. My deck is fine. Just melted the two pots that it was in, plastic containers, to my deck, which is not really my deck since I'm renting. 
This is the second time I've gotten to use the fire extinguisher in the two months I've been here. This new place. I'm the Josh Morris of apartment renting. Hi, Josh. All right. Looks like Rowan is here. Cliff is here. Hey, Cliff. And Josh is here. Looking for Max, Nevea, Steven, and Adam. Today you're going to be able to uh, just listen to the sultry sound of my voice. This is KMOX 401 Radio, left of the right. I'm going to read you a little bit of this stuff and uh, kind of give you a good intro to geometry. I figured who better to give you the intro than Mr. Paul Lockhart. Lord knows I'm not as good as him as an orator. I'm going to read you what he has to say. Lindsay, let me know if you're here. The first time I used the fire extinguisher was uh, when my oven caught on fire. To no fault of my own. Turns out it was older than I am. And uh, I spent $38 moving the oven. Not because I wanted to. I didn't move in. Fast, you know. like, okay, I'll do that. Earlier is better than later. I made a money. Let's do it. And uh, they didn't clean the place like they said they would. How do I know this? Well, for one, there's no chicken. Um, the other thing was my dishwasher had a bunch of junk in the bottom of it, including silverware, napkins, all kinds of things. Um, this was not ready. I asked him to come back and clean it. It felt bad, but, you know, do what you got to do. So it's still chicken wing. Anyway, it turns out the oven had a bunch of grease on the back of it. It's older than I was. So it caught on fire. It uh, really hurt my neighbors. That's what pissed me off. So, I have a new oven now, and my neighbors do too. Or at least they will. Still fighting that good fight. Max, I see you. Carter, I see you. Housing gate's here. Can't do that. Only one housing gate. Actually, there were two. Nolan. You're not related to Nolan. Right? Tyler's here. Geneva's here. Lindsay! Where are ya? Tickler's here. Wonderful. I'm um, still waiting for Steven and Nevea. Also waiting for Lindsay. Let me know if you're here. Josh, I, I saw you. You're good. I'll be reading from the scripture. The book of Lockhart. The book is called Measurement. I wish he called it this. Much more interesting title. Measurement's boring. It's so boring I didn't read it for like two years. It's a great book. So far. Lindsay! Wonderful. Glad to see you. If you guys want, you can, you know, turn up the volume and walk around the house, because I'll be reading from the scripture today. I have a few announcements I want to make first. And to be clear, I'm still waiting for Stephen and Nevea. For those of you that did meet with me last week about your portfolio, nice job. Almost everybody did an excellent job. Uh, go back and read the comments that I put on, if you haven't already. Go and read other people's comments that I have, or other people's pages that I commented on, because... It can help you with your own problems, and also it can show you what a good comment looks like, not to toot my own horn, but I'm pretty good at this. Um, so if you look what a good comment looks like, it can help you figure out what you might want to do when you start commenting on other people's. As time goes on, I'm going to be doing less and less commenting, and I'm going to be making you guys do more and more. I want this to be a peer activity, not led by above from some authority. It's not how math works. It's not democracy. I'm not about it. So if you want to see what a good comment looks like, go check those out. Usually I talk about how you can take the problem further, what I like about your ideas, and I sincerely mean it when I say it, and if I don't sincerely mean it, then I don't say it. Look at that stuff. For those of you that didn't meet with me last week, Skylar, um, about your uh, portfolios. We're going to be doing it this week. For you guys that are here in person, it'll be Thursday after class. If we can squeeze it in, great. If we can't, we're going to have to do it online, okay, at some point. Soon, like by the end of this week. And I, we need to meet and talk about whatever it is you're doing. So it, just like everybody else, you, you will get graded on Thursday. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. I wish I could get rid of grades. Hi, Steven. Um, but I can't. It's your only grades for the semester is just the portfolio stuff, right? And you decide how much you want to put in it, how much work you want to do on it, etc. As long as you feel okay coming to me and saying, this is why I deserve an A, Right? And you can back it up, then you're fine. I want it to be student-led. Some of you have higher expectations of an A than others, but at the end of the day, my expectations are most of them. So 
that we have that conversation. Let me go back and forth. I'll put in grades, hopefully uh, by the end of today for last week, with comments for your parents to read. Um, so for those of you that have meet, we're going to meet Thursday or Friday for portfolios. So Stephen, you'll meet Friday. We'll do something online. We'll figure it out. In the future, the rest of you, and including the people that didn't meet last week, we're going to meet on Wednesdays. That's the plan. Okay, for portfolio review stuff, that will be our Wednesday class always. Um, whether your teachers are making you show up for a full class on Wednesdays or not, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a sign-up sheet up, and you can sign up for what time you want to meet with me to review your portfolio. Now, if you're like, oh my God, my teachers are going to make me do stuff, or I don't know when I'm free. Well, you're free during this hour, right? So sign up during this class. But for obvious reasons, I don't want everybody signing up during one class because it's going to be hard to get through y'all. I'd rather space it out up until like 3.30 or so. That's the point. Whatever time works for you. I think it should be illegal to do school for high schoolers before like 9.30. So if you want to not sign up for, you know, 9.30-ish, good for you. Okay? That's the plan. I'll be reading from uh, Lockhart's book, Paul Lockhart. The uh, book is called Measurement. Feel free to listen. We won't be getting through all of it. If this excites you, if it intrigues you, if it makes you interested, I would encourage you to read the rest of it. It's on Google Classroom. Just go to the Classwork tab. It should say something about Lockhart, something about an excerpt from his book, Measurement. Should have brought water today. I have to use that hand sanitizer. <laughs> Is it unsanitary if we use the same straw that I drink out of? We ask for more straws. I thought about doing that last year when we got that big tub. Be like, dear Mr. Superintendent, thank you for the hand sanitizer. Great timing since COVID is coming. I called that a couple weeks in advance. Um, unfortunately, it seems we've only received one straw for the class, and I feel it will be unsanitary for us all to drink from the same one. Here's truly. Never did send that email, but man, do I wish I did. Reality, imagination. There are many realities out there. There is, of course, the physical reality we find ourselves in. Then there are those imaginary universes that resemble physical reality very closely, such as the one where everything is exactly the same, except I didn't pee my pants in the fifth grade. Anybody seen a movie with Adam Sandler, Billy Madison? Okay, we'll have to watch that. Or the one where that beautiful dark-haired girl on the bus turned to me and we started talking and ended up falling in love. There are plenty of those kinds of imaginary realities, believe me. But that's neither here nor there. I want to talk about a different sort of place. I'm going to call it mathematical reality. In my mind's eye, there is a universe where beautiful shapes and patterns float by and do curious and surprising things that keep me amused and entertained. An amazing place. I really love it. The thing is, physical reality is a disaster. And this was written before 2020. Little did he know. It's way too complicated. Nothing is at all what it appears to be. Objects expand and contract with temperature. Atoms fly on and they fly off. And in particular, nothing can truly be measured. Nothing can be. You or a blade of grass have no actual length. Guys, I might be 6'2". There's hope for my Tinder profile. Any measurement made in this universe is necessarily a rough approximation. It's not bad, it's just the nature of the place. The smallest speck is not a point, and the thinnest wire is not a line. Mathematical reality, on the other hand, is imaginary. It can be as simple and as pretty as I want it to be. I get to have all these perfect things I can't have in real life. I'll never hold a circle in my hand. You will never hold a circle in your hand. They don't exist. They're not real. But I can hold one in my mind. And I can measure it. Max, you can't hear me? Try turning up your volume. It looks like my mic is on. Everybody else can hear me? Y'all good? Everybody else able to hear? You might have dipped. Max, let me know if you're good or not. If not, we can go back. It'll be on the YouTube video, and you can watch it later. Or you can go read it yourself, okay? Okay. Circles aren't real, guys. You'll never hold them in your hands. You can't measure it. But I can hold one in my mind. And I can measure it. Mathematical reality is a beautiful wonderland of my own creation. And I can explore it and think about it and talk about it with my friends. If you have friends. Maybe they're imaginary, too. 
Now, there are lots of reasons people get interested in physical reality. Astronomers, biologists, chemists, and all the rest are trying to figure out how it works, how to describe it. I want to describe mathematical reality, to make patterns, to figure out how they work. That's what mathematicians like me try to do. Point is, I get to have them both, physical reality and mathematical reality. Both are beautiful and interesting and somewhat frightening. The former is important to me because I am in it. The later, the latter, ugh, because it is in me. I get to have both these wonderful things in my life, and so do you. My idea with this book is that we will design patterns. We'll make patterns of shape and motion. And then we will try to understand our patterns and measure them. We will see beautiful things. But I won't lie to you. This is going to be very hard work. Mathematical reality is an infinite jungle full of enchanting mysteries, but the jungle does not give up its secrets easily. To be uh, prepared to struggle, both intellectually and creatively, the truth is I don't know of any human activity as demanding of one's imagination, intuition, and ingenuity. But I do it anyway. I do it because I love it and I can't help it. Once you've been to the jungle, you can never really leave. It haunts your waking dreams. And I want to emphasize creatively. Math is creative. It is an art form. God, if you're going to have stuff on in my class, at least mute it so I can't hear it. It is an art form, first and foremost. It is also a science, but it is an art. You guys ever created something? You guys write a poem, make a movie, make music? You make beats? What do you do? Nothing? Everybody's response. Did you do anything creative in kindergarten? Probably. I used to teach K through six, believe it or not. <laughs> oh my god, can you imagine? Um, and I found that kindergartners are more creative than first graders, and first graders are more creative than second graders, and second graders are more creative than third graders, and fourth graders are a hell of a lot more creative than high schoolers. I think you're all creative initially. And then we give you this idea that they're creative people and not creative people. We beat the creativity out of you. That's a shame. I think we teach you conformity, and when you conform, you lose creativity. You're very good at jumping hoops and following direction, writing your name on the line, remembering to put your date on there. You're not very good at creating your own ideas. You used to be. And geometry is a really harsh reality when you pop into this class, because for so long, math has been about following rules and putting the numbers in the right spot and doing the right steps. And then you get to geometry, and there are no steps. There's no way we can fake it. There's no way that we can take this art form and say, here's how you do it. You know, sometimes you can be like, here's how you draw a person. Start one, draw a circle for the head, right? But that's not really how you draw a person, right? It's kind of an outline. Well, we've been showing you just the outline of math for so long and teaching you that that's all there is, man. What's painting? We don't show you Michelangelo. We don't show you all this stuff. We show you a fence, and we say, look, see this fence? It is white. It was painted. This is what painting is. And that's what we do with mathematics. We show you the fence, and we could be showing you what it really is. And then when you get to geometry, there's two options. Option A is you have definitions to class, where they try to make it an outline as much as possible, just like they did for algebra and every other thing they ruined. And it sucks. It is the worst math class. Everyone hates it the most because it is the worst of what makes math terrible. It's just definitions all the time, all memorization, no understanding. You just got to know it or you don't. Or there's option B. The option where we go in and we use geometry to be the best of all math class. It is the most interesting, most detailed, most explainable most understandable, most imaginary part of mathematics. And I'm paid, and I have to be here every day at 8 a.m. I have to give the same spiel every single class, and if I've got to do that, I'm going to do option B. That's what I decided a couple of times. tired of it. It is creative. So I invite you to go on an amazing adventure. And of course, I want you to love this jungle and to fall under its spell. What I've tried to do in this book is to express how math feels and to show you a few of our most beautiful and exciting... Uh-oh. I knew it would happen. Exciting discoveries. 
Don't expect any footnotes or references or anything scholarly like that. This is personal. I just hope I can manage to convey these deep and fascinating ideas in a way that is comprehensible and fun. And that's the key. That's how I feel about this class. Still, expect it to be slow going. I have no desire to baby you or to protect you from the truth. And I'm not going to apologize for how hard it is. Let it take hours or even days for a new idea to sink in. It may have originally taken centuries. There's a couple points there. By the end of high school, we expect you to have mastered all of the mathematics that humankind has learned since the beginning of math all the way to about the 1700s. By the end of high school, every person in America. That is insane. And if it's not insane, then why are we stopping at 1700s? Hasn't there been, you know, some pretty big changes in the last 300 years? Like, for instance, the birth of the United States. When I say the birth of the United States, the birth of America, what I mean is the white America that we have today, right? There were originally native people here that were slaughtered and killed. I took their land. I mean, it existed way before us, 1776. But, you know, but yeah, that's one thing that has changed. Yeah, we stop at like 1700 with calculus and act like that's the end-all be-all. Oh, man, you got to be real smart to understand that. Dude, people in 1700 didn't know that peeing in the street was bad for your health. If they can do calculus, oh, my gosh, you guys can. But it's a lot of math to do, you know, 1700 years plus of math, right? We ask y'all to do it. It's going to be hard. But not hard in the sense of like, life is hard, math is hard, get over it. That's a poster I saw when I first walked into a math room when I was subbing before I was a math teacher. And I saw that walking, the first thing I saw walking into a classroom. Life is hard, math is hard, get over it. it wasn't my classroom, but I tore the poster down. Which your boy does. Gangsta. Because, especially with the phrase, life is hard, this is usually used at people, right? Oh, you got it so bad, well, there are people over there that got it worse. Stop complaining. Get over it. And so your life doesn't get any better because it's worse for others. And their life doesn't get any better because you didn't do anything to make their life better, and they're not doing anything to make their life better because they're somewhat worse off than them. And the people above you aren't doing anything because they're looking at you and going, man, how can I change the world? Look at this person. See how bad they've got it? I have no right to do that. And nothing ever changes. This is not hard. Math is not hard in the sense that, oh, it's hard, life is hard, get over it. No, 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 no. It is hard in the sense that changing the world is hard. But it's a beautiful, wonderful thing that you must do. And it's up to you, no one else. And you can't say, well, it's too hard for me. Let somebody else do it. This is your time. My generation, we've done our thing. And we had some successes and we had a lot of failures and you're going to have the same thing. You must move the needle forward. It is up to you. I'm going to assume that you love beautiful things and are curious to learn about them. The only things you will need on this journey are common sense and simple human curiosity. So relax. Art is to be enjoyed and this is an art book. Math is not a race or a contest. It's just you playing with your imagination. Math is yours, not someone else's. Have a wonderful time. Anybody have any thoughts so far? They never do. On problems. What is a math problem? <laughs> to a mathematician, a problem is a probe. <laughs> A test of mathematical reality to see how it behaves. It is our way of poking at it with a stick. I need to get the stick. I haven't used it. That's why I got this guy. The hook. It was left to me by the last math teacher. I can only imagine what they used it for. We have a piece of mathematical reality, which may be a configuration of shapes, a number pattern, or what have you. And we want to understand what makes it tick -ler. What does it do and why does it do it? So we poke it. Only not with our hands and not with a stick. We have to poke it with our minds. As an example, let's say you've been playing around with triangles, chopping them up into other triangles and so forth, and you happen to make a discovery because you're a nerd. When you connect each corner of a triangle to the middle of the opposite side, so corner of a triangle to the middle of the opposite side. So we're going from here to here, right? There's the middle of the opposite side. The three lines seem to all meet together at a point. Are you quite finished? 
I'm just giving you crap. That's all. There's always someone who like coughs in class, and I go enough. Or like someone sneezes, right? You're supposed to say bless you. I just yell at them. I think it's funny. This year it's even funnier because it's 2020. Not probably not funny. I don't know. I don't know. I love you all. If I'm ever yelling at you, it's because I'm playing a character on TV. It's not because I'm actually like that in person. I swear. You try this for a wide variety of triangles and it always seems to happen. It always seems to intersect in the middle. Now you have a mystery, but let's be very clear about exactly what the mystery is. It's not about your drawings or what uh, looks like is happening on paper, right? Calm down. It's just a drawing. I don't have my soundboard on. The question of what pencil and paper triangles may or may not do is a scientific one about physical reality. If your drawing is sloppy, for example, then the lines won't meet. I suppose you could make an extremely careful drawing and put it under a microscope. I didn't flip the page, sorry. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Microscope. Don't need to stop. I'm missing page six. How embarrassing. But you would learn a lot more about graphite and paper fibers than you would about triangles if you looked in that microscope. The real mystery is about imaginary, two perfect to exist triangles, and the question is whether these perfect lines meet in a perfect point in mathematical reality. No pencils or microscopes will help you now. You cannot use this in this classroom. You cannot use a ruler. Because if you use a ruler, you have a specific triangle in mind. It doesn't prove it for all triangles. It's going to be really frustrating for some of you in here. Triangles don't really exist. They're imperfect in the real world. The only triangles that we're interested in are perfect triangles, and those are the only ones we can imagine, and you can't imagine a ruler. Imagine a triangle. Now take out a ruler. How big is it? Right? Even if you imagine a ruler, it doesn't work. We have to think of another way of doing this. That's what makes it so difficult. Can anything ever really be known about such imaginary objects? What form could such knowledge take? But examining these issues, let's take a moment to simply delight in the question itself and to appreciate what is being said here about the nature of mathematical reality. What we've stumbled onto is a conspiracy. Apparently there is some underlying and as yet unknown structural interplay going on that is making this happen. I think that is marvelous and also a little scary. What do triangles know that we don't? Sometimes it makes me a little queasy to think about all the beautiful and profound truths out there just waiting to be discovered and connected together. So what exactly is the mystery here? The mystery is why? Why? Why would a triangle want to do such a thing? After all, if you drop three sticks at random, they usually don't meet at a point, right? If you take three sticks and just drop them, they're going to look like this, right? Getting them to all land at one point would be very difficult. Are you smelling what I'm stepping in? When I ask you that question, I want you to trust no one. That's my first rule in here. If you're just shaking your head because you don't want to look dumb, that's a good way to look dumb because I can't tell you the number of times I've taught calculus. We spent an entire hour on the board writing out a problem. I'd ask them, okay, so what next? What do you think? And I write it down, and we go, and everybody would agree, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. We get to the end of the problem. The problem was about a ladder. How fast is it falling, like sliding down a house, right? It's sitting here, and it's slowly sliding out with a person on it, right? You've been there. We've all been there. And the speed at which it's going is fine for the answer, but then we notice that the answer is positive, but the ladder is falling down, so shouldn't the number be negative? And the class groans and goes, oh my god, we made a mistake, and the bell rings. I will lead you wherever you lead me. You ever been in a supermarket or something with somebody, and you're like, they're leading you, right? And they think you're leading them. And you realize, like, neither of you is leading. That's going to happen in here. Because you're used to being led along by a hook. I'm not going to do that. I think it's cruel and unusual. It isn't very good for learning. You are the leaders in here. I will write down whatever you say, more or less. I might question it, but I do that even if you're right. When you drop three sticks randomly, doesn't it make sense they're going to form something like this at best? All connecting at one point would be pretty rare. right? So three lines, if you just connect them in a triangle, odds are you're going to get something like this. What we are looking for is an explanation. Of course, one reason why an explanation might not be forthcoming is that it simply isn't true. That's always a possibility in here. Our thing that we thought, oh, maybe this is something all triangles do, might not be true, right? That's totally possible. We're coming up with it. 
We've been wrong before, we can be wrong again. Maybe we fooled ourselves by wishfully thinking or clumsy drawing. There's a lot of fudging in physical reality. So maybe we just couldn't see the little triangle where the lines cross, right? Maybe this triangle right here does, it doesn't intersect at a point. Maybe it's a tiny little triangle. It just gets really, really close. On the other hand, it's certainly the kind of thing that could be true, right? If you drop them enough, maybe eventually they would all randomly hit the same spot, right? No reason why they couldn't. It has a lot of elements that mathematicians look for. This thing right here. It has naturalness, elegance, simplicity, and a certain inevitable quality, right? Eventually, they will all intersect at one point. That's probably true, but again, the question is why. We don't care what is true and what isn't. We don't care about that in here. It's interesting, I guess, but like, who in here is interested that, oh my gosh, they all intersect at a point? Like, who cares? Probably not you guys, right? And I don't really care either. That's not what I'm selling you here. What I'm selling you is the mystery of maybe why they are. Understanding why they are is far more interesting knowing that they do. Most geometry classes, option A, right, we talked about earlier, is, hey, by the way, if you draw a line from the middle and line to the middle, line to the middle, they all intersect at a point. Those are called medians, and what they produce is the medicenter. Remember that for the quiz. Who cares? Who cares? Why do they do that? That has a chance of being interesting. Now here's where the art comes in. In order to explain, we have to create something. You're going to have to create in here. Every day. Namely, we need to know somehow to construct an argument. A piece of reasoning that will satisfy our curiosity. Not mine, yours. As to why this behavior is happening. This is a very tall order, because you're tough to convince. Trust me, I have to do it every day. For one thing, it's not enough to build or draw a bunch of physical triangles and see that it more or less works for them, right? If I test it on 100 triangles, does it mean it's going to work on every? No. This is not an explanation. It's more of an approximate verification. Seems like it's going to work. Ours is a much more serious philosophical issue. Without knowing why the lines meet at a common point, how can we know that they actually do? In contrast with physical reality, there's nothing to observe. It's imaginary. How will we ever know anything about a purely imaginary realm? The point is, it doesn't matter so much what is true, it matters why it's true. The why is the what in here. Not the answer that matters, it's the why, the process. How did you come up with it and can you justify it? Am I convinced by it? Not that I'm trying to minimize the value of our ordinary senses. Far from it. We desperately need any and all aids to our, uh, for whatever we can get. Uh, sorry, to our intuition, imagination, drawings, models, movies, whatever we can get. We just have to understand that ultimately that these things are not really the subject of the conversation and cannot really tell us the truth about mathematical reality. So now we really are in a predicament. We have discovered what we may think to be a beautiful truth. And now we need to prove it. This is what mathematicians do, and this is what I hope you will enjoy doing yourself. Is this such an extraordinarily difficult thing to do? Yeah, it really is. Is there some recipe or method to follow? No, there isn't. There are no steps. This is abstract art, pure and simple. And art is always a struggle. I'm going to say that again. Art is always a struggle. Anything worth pursuing is a struggle. Justice is a struggle. Peace is a struggle. Art is a struggle. And that doesn't make it bad. There is no systematic way to create beautiful and meaningful paintings or sculptures, and there is also no method for producing beautiful and meaningful mathematical arguments. Sorry. Math is the hardest thing there is, and that doesn't make it bad. It's not get over it. It's one of the reasons why I love it. So no, I can't tell you how to do it. I'm not going to hold your hand or give you a bunch of hints or solutions in the back of the book. If you want to paint a picture from your heart, there is no answer on the painting of the back of the canvas. Right? Oh, look up the odds, right? It's not how things work. If you are working on a problem and you are stuck in, and stuck in pain, then welcome to the club. We mathematicians don't know how to solve our problems either. If we did, they would no longer be problems. We're always working at the edge of the unknown. And we're always stuck until we have a breakthrough. And I hope you have many. It's an incredible feeling. But there is no specific procedure for doing mathematics. You just have to think a lot and hope the inspiration comes to you. And that's dangerous for a teacher. That's why they simplify it down to these steps to solve a problem, right? 
So how are you going to be like, it's creative, go for it. How do I know they're learning? Oh my god, right? They're scared, and they should be, because the system's really against them. And it's against you guys. But we're going to take a risk in here. But I won't just drop you into the jungle and leave you there. Your intelligence and your curiosity, you will have to supply yourself. That's you. I can't make it for you. I can't motivate you. That doesn't work as much as teachers want to think it does. But maybe I can provide you with a compass in the form of a few general words of advice. And here they are. The first is that the best problems are your own. They're not mine. Maybe they started out as mine, but they have to become your own problem. Or, or begin in the birth inside your head. Those are the ones you care about. Those are the things that you Google. Those are the things that you think about automatically. When they're my problems, who cares? This is exemplified by people not caring about something until it happens in their own backyard. We don't care about a person's rights until that person's rights that is being violated happens to be my son or daughter. That's a shame. The problem has to become your own. You are the intrepid mental explorer. It's your mind and your adventure. Mathematical reality is yours, not mine. It's in your head for you to explore anytime you feel like it. What are your questions? Where do you want to go? I've enjoyed coming up with some problems for you to think about. I have. That's true. But there are mere, these are merely, merely seeds that I planted to help you start growing your own jungle. Don't be afraid that you can't answer your own questions. That's the natural state of a mathematician. Not knowing is what we do, buddy. Also, try to always have five or six problems you're working on. This is super good for music, art, etc. Right? Have a bunch of songs. Take breaks. I used to sneak into the practice room at midnight to work, uh, practice uh, music and stuff, drums, all kinds of things, because our professor was an adjunct professor, which is what most professors are now. They're not given a full salary, but they're given a full workload. And they're promised that eventually they'll become a full professor if they just stay on for 10 years with very little pay. And she had a sick mother. So not only was she not making enough money for her, but she also really wasn't making enough money to take care of her mom. And so what she did is during the, the day, Monday through Friday, is use the practice room to teach lessons, right, to high school kids, how to drum and all that stuff. She had to. That meant college kids that were there paying the big bucks to use the room to get better at music couldn't use it all day. So as soon as I get in there, it's midnight. Now, never mind, the music department closes at 11, <laughs> right? Security's walking around kicking people out. You just got to be clever. Hide underneath the bleachers, find a closet here or there. Don't play the drums until an hour after they're gone, thus midnight. And hopefully you won't get caught. That's what I had to do. And I practiced for three hours because I didn't know I'd get up for class at 8 in the morning. Oh my God, it would be illegal. So I wanted to practice for three hours because that's why I was there, to get better at music. How am I going to get better at music if I don't practice? But here's the thing. Practicing for three hours is a lot worse than practicing for an hour, taking a half hour break, and then practicing for another hour. Your brain needs to take rest. It has to. Resting is where learning happens. Playing video games is where learning about math happens, as long as you're doing math before it. You must take breaks. Don't spend time doing homework. You won't do it in this class, obviously, but other classes. Sitting there banging your head against the wall. Not good for you, and it doesn't help you learn. What are you doing right now? Triple kill. Doing math, Mom. That's a valid answer. You need to take breaks. 360 no-scope. Another important piece of advice, collaborate. If you have a friend who also wants to do math, they can be imaginary as well. You can work together and share the joys and frustrations, as long as they're not Jericho Borman. It's a lot like playing music together. Sometimes I'll spend six or eight hours with breaks, working on a problem with a friend, and even if we accomplish next to nothing, we'll still have fun feeling dumb together, because that's what friends do. Let it be hard. Try not to get discouraged or take your failures too personally. It's not only you that is having trouble understanding mathematical reality. It's all of us. It's always an us problem. It's never a you. Don't worry that you have no experience or that you're not qualified. What makes a mathematician is not technical skill or encyclopedic knowledge, but insatiable curiosity and desire for simple beauty. Just be yourself and go where you want to go. Instead of being tentative and fearing failure or confusion, try to embrace the awe and mystery of it all. And joyfully make a mess. Yes, your ideas won't work. Yes, your intuition will be flawed. Again, welcome to the club. I have a dozen bad ideas a day, and so does every other mathematician. I have a dozen bad ideas before noon. Now, I know what you're thinking. A bunch of fuzzy, romantic talk about beauty and art and exquisite pain of creativity is all very well and good, but how on earth am I supposed to do the damn thing? I've never created a mathematical argument in my life. Can't you little, give me a little more to go on. Let's go back to our triangle and the three lines. How can we begin to cobble together some sort of an argument? One place we could start looking is at a symmetrical triangle. So it doesn't prove it for all triangles, but it proves it for this particular one, a symmetrical one. You know how they talk about beautiful people, how their face is symmetrical? Right? If you were to flip it, their eye would match with their eye, their lip would match with the end of their lip, ear would match with the ear. Bad news for your boy. But this triangle is symmetrical in our imaginary world. 
This kind of triangle is called the equilateral. I love Latin. Because <clears throat> without knowing the word, you can figure out what it means. In English, if I say kumquat and you don't know what that means, if you try to break that word apart, you're going to have a bad time. Right? You're not going to understand what it means. But in Latin, equilateral, equal, equal, lateral, lateral pass in football. It's a side pass, isn't it? Equal side. Try doing that with kumquat. Now, I know this is an absurdly atypical situation, but the idea is that if we can somehow explain why the lines meet in this special case, it might give us a clue about how to proceed with a more general triangle. So, not the problem we we're looking at, but a similar one. If this speaks to you, take a look at this. This is what we're going to be doing. I highly encourage you to read up to page 12. It's only two more pages, but you do it if you want to. Only if you want to. See you later. Take care. See you in a couple days. Bye, everybody. I'm going to sort these papers. We got everybody except Nevaeh. We'll continue this on. Hey, let me spray your desk now. Hello, everyone. I hope your Labor Day was great. Did anybody also set their desk up or their uh, deck on fire? Was it just me? Okay. Second time I've got to use the fire extinguisher since I moved in slide. My deck. I mean, I stopped the fire. It didn't really burn down. It just caught on fire. I was saying earlier that, it, you know, did anybody else almost catch their deck on fire? But the reality is that I did. Hey! Hey, six feet. No, six feet. No, six feet. Man, no. Please, six feet. No touching. No touching. Gotta have space for activities, gentlemen. Let me sort my pages, and then I'll take Tendi. Do a couple of announcements, then you guys can listen to today's class, kind of like a podcast. I'm going to be leading, reading aloud from the Book of Measurement by Paul Lockhart. I figure, who better to tell you about geometry than Paul himself? I have no control of it, I'm sorry. That's why I wear long sleeves, I'm sorry. If I could control it, I would. I've complained about it. So I was cooking paella, and I made paella, and it was delicious. And then, um, at the end, like good Boy Scout, I, um... Took the coals by hand after letting them cool for a bunch of hours. I moved them by hand, that's how cool they were, right? Into a separate bucket before throwing them in the dumpster, right? Then I poured water on them. There's dirt in the bottom of the bucket, poured water on them, all was good, steamed, right? Three hours later, the thing's on fire, it's melted to the bottom of the deck. So, I don't know. So, obviously, I'm very glad it's raining right now, because apparently the first amount of water wasn't good. Yeah, second time I got to the first time I got to use the stove caught on fire. Um, that was not my doing, it was because they never cleaned out the apartment. And how I know how do I know that? Well, I walked upstairs when I first got there and there's a chicken wing sitting there. Um, amongst many other things. Uh, it turns out that the dishwasher also hadn't been cleaned out and a bunch of other things, but the dishwasher had like tons of silverware and napkins and all kinds of crap in the bottom of it. And it just obviously I hadn't cleaned it out. I paid two hundred and thirty eight dollars to move in early. You'd think that'd go somewhere, right? Apparently not. Landlords are a scourge upon our society. Housing should be free, um, or at least affordable. God. But anyway, um, turns out the, gr the stove had a bunch of grease on the back of it. It's all down the back. No grease catches fire. Um, and a dumber person than I, which there are a few, but there are some, um, might have used water to put that fire out and really caused problems. Luckily, I knew how to use a fire extinguisher.
grease in it. I put the fire out. Um, not only was there grease on the back, but the, the oven's older than I am. Ovens usually last about 15 years, right? And this one had gone a lot earlier, but no one fixed it. That wouldn't be profitable. Um, apparently, the lives of my neighbors and myself are not worth the 500 bucks it would take to go to Home Depot and buy a new one every day. In the process of getting a new one for trouble. Always. So, that's what happened. Let's take Tendi, and then we'll read from Paul Lockhart's book on geometry. It's called Measurement, which is a really crappy title. I wish you would have called it Reality and Imagination. Measurement is a boring thing. It's so boring that when I bought the book, because a friend recommended it to me, I didn't read it for two years. Phenomenal book so far. I wanted to share this with you guys because I think he has a good introduction to geometry, better than I can do. Let's do Tendi. Sure got water today. I'm doing a lot of speaking in the radio voice today. Welcome to KMOX W4ML. To the right or the left, left or the right, I'll be your guide, Derek McAnally, host of the 4 o'clock afternoon show. Logan's here, Troy's here, Maddie Banks is here. Woo! Yeah, Maddie, you have a good weekend? Great, no one cares. Isaiah's here, Cooper's here, Ann's here, Zach's here, Jackson is here, baby. Mitchell's here, Gina's here, oh my god, Mitchell is here. Um, Jordan is here, Jamie. Jamie? Donde esta, Jamie? Did you? Okay. Oh, I see her, yep, 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 yep. Uh, Gage, donde esta? I didn't see you after school, I was really hoping to see you and we get the setup, bud, that's not good. Um, CJ, donde esta? Andrew, donde esta? Demery is here. Olivia, donde esta? That's what I'm saying. Olivia's here. Wonderful. CJ, donde esta? Lexi, donde esta? Well, they're checking in. I'll make some announcements. That's why you need to be here on time. Not because uh, I'll be mad, but because I have announcements. You're going to miss them. It's going to suck. Uh, that's not true. I get mad at systems of oppression and the people that perpetuate them, like landlords. Anyway, how y'all doing? Um, announcements. Oh, nice. Hi, Lexi. Um, if you did not meet with me last week to discuss a portfolio, you know who you are. You're going to be doing so if you're here in person today on Thursday this week. If you're not here in person, if you're here at home, watching at home, playing along, all right, uh, you'll be meeting with me on Friday. Um, we'll try to uh, put it at the end of class. I can't promise you that time because I promised you last week and you, and you goofed and I don't know if I'll have time or not. If I don't have time for you at the end of class, we're going to have to meet online sometime after school. It can literally be between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock that day if you want, whatever, right? Because normally you have school during that time. But we need to do it by the end of the week, okay? We need to. Hopefully you're working on those portfolios if you haven't before. You better bring your A game if you didn't bring your game at all last week. For people that did meet with me last week, and for the people that didn't, um, Wednesdays are going to be the day we meet for our portfolio from now on, okay? Wednesdays. Hey, CJ. And the plan will be this. I'm going to make a sign-up sheet that you can sign up to meet with me at a time during the day between the hours of 8 and 3 p.m. Um, Lord knows it should be illegal to meet with me or do math before 9.30. Um, so if you want to meet later, good for you. Some of you guys, unfortunate people, are having their teachers or have teachers that make you show up for the whole class all day long, and then you can't choose a class time or a time to meet with me, so just sign up during this time, right? Um, but for the rest of you that can sleep in or don't have teachers that are doing that, um, choose a different time for the love of God, right? Sleep in, okay? But that'll be the plan. Wednesdays, we'll meet online. We'll sign up sheet. We'll talk about that later. Cool? Tina, are you okay? Oh, no. I get it. Speaking of sleep, speaking of being okay, if for some reason in here you cannot learn, whether it's because you're too tired, too hungry, too sick, too rest, you do you, man. I'm never going to know you as well as you know you. Put your head down, take a nap, do something. You need to go get food, go up to the office and say, hey, Mr. Max, let me up here. I need to get, go get some food. Let's order a pizza or something. I don't know, right? Do something. If you can't learn, and you know you better than I know you, don't try to learn. If you do that, it's just going to make matters worse. Rest up or do whatever you need to do so maybe you can get your next class set up or maybe tomorrow set up or maybe next week set up. You will be accountable for your actions and you need to provide you know, a portfolio and be able to say, and this is why I deserve an A. If you can't do that, that's tough luck, son. But if you need to take a break, then do that. 
And it's going to be really tough luck if you don't come talk to me and be like, hey, here's why I'm not going to have a good portfolio this week. And at that point, we'll say, okay, I understand. When can we get that done? And we'll discuss a time. We have to discuss it. Do not take advantage of this system unless you need to. I provide this because some people need to take a break. I think that makes sense. Why force you guys to do something really crappily? I'm exhausted. Great, you have to learn math now. Why? Let's teach people really poorly. Sounds great. Everybody wins. All right, if you want to follow along on uh, Google Classroom, there's a classwork page. Um, something about Paul Lockhart, the author of this. Uh, the book is uh, Measurement. This is an excerpt from it. If you want to click that or read it at home, there it is. If you want to follow along on the screen, you can do that. Uh, people online, you can kind of treat this like a podcast and just listen to the sound of my sultry voice. I'll be reading you about this stuff. And if you're going to play stuff on your phone or whatever, make sure you mute it so I don't hear it. Okay? Pro tip. Um, I've had to give that to every class today, so don't feel bad, okay? It's just something we got to go over. You guys are going to make your own choices, and inevitably when that happens, free will leads to stupid choices, right? So that's the reality. To learn, you must have free will. If you didn't, I wouldn't give it to you. But I believe in democracy. Gina, are you ready? Reality and imagination. There are many realities out there. There's, of course, the physical reality we find ourselves in. Then there are those... Mitchell, shut up. I say that not because I was getting annoyed, but I could tell other people were. I love you, Mitchell. There are many realities out there. There's, of course, the physical reality we find ourselves in. Then there are those imaginary universes that resemble physical reality very closely, such as the one where everything is exactly the same, except I didn't pee my pants in the fifth grade. Anybody seen Billy Madison? Peeing your pants is cool. I'm Miles Davis. <laughs> or the one where that beautiful dark-haired girl on the bus turned to me and we started talking and ended up falling in love. There are plenty of those kinds of imaginary realities, believe me, but that's neither here nor there. I want to talk about a different sort of place. I'm going to call it mathematical reality. In my mind's eye, there is a universe where beautiful shapes and patterns float by and do curious and surprising things that keep me amused and entertained. It's an amazing place, and I really love it. The thing is, physical reality is a disaster, and this was written before 2020. Little did he know, right? It's way too complicated, and nothing is at all what it appears to be. Objects expand and contract with temperature. Atoms fly on and off. Decks catch on fire after being doused out with water. In particular, nothing can be truly measured. Nothing. You know what this means, right? I can put that I'm 6'2 on my Tinder profile. There's hope. Nothing can be truly measured. A blade of grass has no actual length. Any measurement made in this universe is necessarily a rough approximation. There is no measurement. It's not bad, it's just the nature of the place. The smallest speck is not a point, and the thinnest wire is not a line. Mathematical reality, on the other hand, is imaginary. It can be as simple and as pretty as I want it to be. I get to have all those perfect things I can't have in real life. I will never hold, and neither will you, a circle in your hand. But I can hold one in my mind. Guys, circles aren't real. Neither are triangles. But I can hold one in my mind, and I can measure it. Mathematical reality is a beautiful wonderland of my own creation. And I can explore it and think about it and talk about it with my friends, if you have them. Maybe they're imaginary, too. Now, there are lots of reasons people get interested in physical reality. Astronomers, biologists, chemists, and all the rest that are trying to figure out how it works, how to describe it. I want to describe mathematical reality, to make patterns, to figure out how they work. That's what mathematicians like me try to do. 
The point is I get to have them both. I get both physical reality and mathematical reality. Both are beautiful and interesting and somewhat frightening. The former is important to me because I am in it. The latter because it is in me. I get to have both these wonderful things in my life, and so do you. My idea with this book is that we all, desi all will design patterns. We'll make patterns of shape and motion, and then we will try to understand our patterns and measure them. And we will see beautiful things. But I won't lie to you, this is going to be very hard work. Mathematical reality is an infinite jungle full of enchanting mysteries, but the jungle does not give up its secrets uh, willingly. Be prepared to struggle both intellectually and creatively. The truth is, I don't know of any human activity as demanding of one's imagination, intuition, and ingenuity. But I do it anyway. I do it because I love it and because I can't help it. Once you've been to the jungle, you can never really leave. It haunts your waking. So I invite you to go on an amazing adventure. I invite you. And of course, I want you to love the jungle and to fall under its spell. What I've tried to do in this book is express how math feels. How math feels. And to show you a few of our most beautiful and exciting discoveries. Don't expect any footnotes or references or anything scholarly like that. This is personal. I just hope I can manage to convey these deep and fascinating ideas in a way that is comprehensible and fun, and that's my goal in here. Still, expect it to be slow going. I have no desire to baby you or to protect you from the truth, and I'm not going to apologize for how hard it is. Wish I had my soundboard. Let it take hours or even days for a new idea to sink in. It may have originally taken centuries. I think there's a couple points there. One. When Mr. Mack first walked into a math classroom as a teacher, and I was a substitute, I wasn't a full math teacher yet, although I'm not really one yet either. The first thing I saw when walking into this room was a poster that said, life is hard, math is hard, get over it. And I was a sub, but that did not stop me from tearing down that poster and putting it in the trash can. I don't think that life is hard, math is hard, and you should just get over it. That doesn't mean life isn't hard and that math isn't hard. No, they are. But too often I hear that life is hard, get over it, because, well, somebody else has it worse. You shouldn't complain. And then what happens is your life sucks. And that other person who's worse off than you, their life sucks because you didn't do anything to improve yours, which means you didn't do anything to improve theirs either. And they're not doing anything because they're looking to their left and seeing someone worse off and saying, man, I have no right to improve my life. They've got it worse. And the people above you are saying, well, I can't improve my life because they've got it worse. What happens? We get a really crappy world. A really crappy world. Because we're waiting on the people that have the least crappy lives, the least power, to do something to change it. My generation, kind of over and done. We did our thing. We're getting old. We're getting lazy. We're getting tired. And we had a lot of failures and we had a few successes. It is now up to you. You are the future. You are the next generation. It is your time. This is your time. Not in a couple years. Not when you're 25. Now. You are the ones to change the world. You're the ones with the power. It's up to you. Don't be waiting for someone else to do it. Same thing in math. This is you. Your journey. Life is hard. Math is hard. Get over it. I hate that. All it does is tell people that things can't change. And as we've seen, change happens. The question is, who gets to decide what changes? The people that rise up and take the power. Or the people that already have it. Don't be a pawn in their game. Don't be a pawn in here. My first rule in here is trust no one. Do not trust me. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've taught calculus and took an entire hour to fill up an entire board with an equation. Going along. Okay, what next? And the student says something. Oh, okay, let's write that down. Everybody agree with that? Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. So, uh, makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. Right? We're doing a problem about a ladder, right? Ladder's up against the wall like this, and it's sliding down, right? There's a man on it or something. We've all been there, right? We're trying to figure out how fast the ladder falls. We get to the end, we get some number, and say, like, oh, yes, mm, yes. Oh, good job, everybody. Oh, yes, yes. You're all very proud of each other. And then I say, wait a minute. If the ladder's falling, shouldn't the number be negative? And I hear a collective groan, and they go, oh my god, we screwed it up, and the bell rings. Have fun! I am not leading you in here. You are leading you. The other day I was at a supermarket trying to figure out to get some cheese for a burger from one of my friends that was over. He's a musician over uh, from Mozambique. who's in the Peace Corps. And uh, he eats cheese. I don't. I was making burgers for him. 
Um, and so he's going to go get some cheese. So we walk into the supermarket together. And we're talking about things, you know, what's going on in school right now, all kinds of things, right? And I notice after about like five minutes, we're not going towards the cheese. Like, I don't eat the cheese, so I'm waiting on him to go find it. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't eat cheese. I mean, he's waiting on me because he doesn't know the supermarket, right? He's been in Mozambique the last three years. So I realize that neither of us are leading. He's waiting on the other. Not let that happen in here. It will happen, but don't let it. You are the leader, not me. Another thing that this mentions, expect to be slow going, right? Things are hard. Things are difficult. Lots of things are hard. Changing the world is hard. It doesn't make it bad. Make this personal. It takes centuries to, to learn math, right? That's what we're learning, right? By the time you get out of high school, right, the real smart kids are going to, again, smart. Uh, some of the biggest dummies I've met are in my calculus class. The biggest dummies learn calculus at the end of high school, right? And that's like the epitome, like, oh my god, that's really hard math. Dude, calculus was invented before the 1700s. So you're learning all of math through high school, which is very daunting. You know, beginning of time to 1700s. It's 1,700 plus years of math, and we're expecting you to master it by the time you get out of 12th grade. That's insane. And if it wasn't insane, right, then why are we stopping at 1,700? Surely something has changed in the last 300 years. Can you think of anything? I mean, I can think of one. What happens in the year 1776? Declaration of Independence, right? America is born. And by America is born, what I mean is that America already existed, right? Right. You know, we're talking about white America here. We're talking about, you know, it, ownership change, right? You know, there were a bunch of people living here beforehand that we killed and, you know, murdered and uh, infected with smallpox on purpose to, in order to get rid of their land and take advantage of them, right? So America existed before that. But, like, America as we know it didn't exist when the math that we're saying is the pinnacle of knowledge is like the pinnacle of high school. That's insane to me. But also it makes sense because it's a lot of math, right? It's going to be slow going. We shouldn't expect you guys to master all this by the end of 12th grade. It took them centuries to figure this out. We've got a lot to unpack. I'm going to take it slowly. No rush, okay? I'm going to assume that you love beautiful things and are curious to learn about them. That's quite the assumption. Anybody here consider themselves a creative person? What's interesting is when I used to teach kindergarten, can you imagine, right? When you ask that question to kindergartens, they all raise their hand. First grade, well, most of them. Second grade, most of them. Third grade, half of them. Fourth grade. When you get to high school, same kids. Nobody thinks they're creative. Are they lying as kindergartners? No, they're very creative. They're incredibly creative. I have a question on the board. I'm like, okay, what note comes after this when I was teaching music? And they're like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to Disney World yesterday. No, you didn't. You were here yesterday, Johnny. I'm going to eviscerate you. I'm about to end this man's whole career, right? He's creative. You're very creative in kindergarten. You're excited to go to school. And then what happens? You get educated. Rephrase that. You become compliant. You learn where to put your name to do it every time. You learn to put the date. You learn to write down the notes. You learn that the answer is negative at the end, and if you forget it, you're going to get it wrong. I don't know why. That must just be the last step. You become compliant. The best question is why. Why do we become compliant? I'm not going to get into that. Why are we teaching you to do that? I'm not going to, but it's a good question. It's always the best question. Why? We beat the creativity out of you. Make it miserable to come to school. You're right, it is miserable. Parents will tell you to get over it, and teachers will tell you to get over it. You know, it was good enough for me. It worked for me, it should work for you. Just as bad as I can't do anything about it. There are worse people. People that are worse off. Take that crap. I'm going to assume that you love beautiful things and are curious to learn about them, but you've just forgotten. You've been beaten now. We're going to work to get that. There's two options for geometry. There's two ways to teach, and I'll be honest, I used to teach it the first way. Everybody does. The first way is it's definitions of the class. Here's what a line is. Here's what a point is. Here's the vertical angles theorem. Here's this. And if you know what they are, you're going to pass the test. And if you don't know what they are, well, then you don't know it, so too bad. Why are vertical angles congruent? Why does a line always com be comprised of at least two points? What can we do with that? Who cares, right? 
Never answer any of those questions. Because it won't be on the test. If I started talking about it, there's going to be some kid who's, this is going to be on the test. You're thinking it right now while I'm going through this spiel, right? Great question. There are no tests. It can be a part of your portfolio, though. Do I like portfolio? Is if you want. Is it important? Talk about it. That's option A. Option B is to teach geometry is not the worst version of math, right? The most rule following, definition following version of math, right? You know, algebra, there's some creativity in it, just a little bit. There's not much, but there's a little bit in there. You know, you still have to follow the steps and all that crap that we tell you is math when in reality it's not. It's like saying, hey, you want to learn painting? Here's a painting. Look at my fence. See how I painted it? That's what painting is. We're going to practice that every day. That's, I mean, it's painting, but it's not, it's not painting. What you're doing in algebra class and all this stuff beforehand is not really math. It's, it's something, I mean, I guess it's math, but it's not really math. And then you're like, painting the fence is boring. And we're like, what do you mean it's boring? You need this for your life. And we get shocked when you guys tune out. No, duh. It sucks. And if it just sucked and that's just how the way it was, you know, that's just the way life is. That's just the way life is, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that's something you just got to suck up and do. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't believe in that crap most of the time. But the thing is, is that there's way better math out there. Why do we do that? There's this great thing, and we're just like, here, check out painting the fence. And if you're nice and you get to the advanced class, then we'll show you the new stuff, right? Real good stuff. And the reality is the advanced classes don't do it either. They just go faster. They paint more fences. It's a joke. So I choose to teach it the second one. And not have it be the worst of all the math classes, but actually the best of all the math classes. Because there's so much to geometry, it can be the best, most creative, most interesting math class you take. It can change your whole mind about math. Or it could really reinforce that it sucks. I'm going to do the second one. I'm going to assume that you love beautiful things and are curious to learn about them. The only things you will need on this journey are common sense and simple human curiosity. Relax. Art is to be enjoyed. And this is an art book. Math is not a race. It is not a contest. It's just you playing with your own imagination. Math is within you. Have a wonderful time. Any thoughts so far? Yeah. Eventually, I knew you'd have something. They always do. And I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that sincerely. I hope you understand how I feel about your, your brain. I think I've made that clear on multiple occasions. It's a good thing. On problems. What is a math problem? To a mathematician, a problem is a probe. Beep! A test of math mathematical reality to see how it behaves. It is our way of poking it with a stick. Wait, wait, wait. All right. Okay, this is what the last teacher left. The old group, good old hook. Right? They hook you in, they pull you in. I'm not going to be doing that in this class. You are leading, not me. You cannot motivate someone, no matter how much teachers think they can. Motivation has to come from within. And the only reason you don't, aren't motivated from within is because we've been doing this too much. Killed your motivation. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take some risks in here. We have a piece of mathematical reality, which may be a configuration of shapes, of number, pattern, wh whatever you have, right? And we want to understand what makes it tickler. What does it do, and why does it do it? So we poke it. We poke the problems, not the kids. Only not with our hands and not with a stick. We have to poke it with our minds. As an example, let's say you've been playing around with triangles because you're a freaking nerd, chopping them up into other triangles and so forth, and you happen to make a discovery. Mmm, pizza. When you connect each corner of the triangle to the middle of the opposite side, the three lines seem to all meet at a point. You try this for a wide variety of triangles, all kinds of different triangles. You know, all the different varieties, all the different flavors. And it always seems to happen. Now, you have a mystery, but let's be very clear about exactly what the mystery is. It's not about your drawing and what looks like is happening on paper. No, no, no. The question of what pencil and paper triangles may or may not do is a scientific question about physical reality. Because if your drawing is sloppy, then the lines won't meet. I suppose you could make an extremely careful drawing and put it under a microscope, he says. But you would learn a lot more about graphite and paper fibers than you would about triangles. Guys, triangles don't exist. Neither do circles. They are purely imaginary. And I'll explain why later. 
The real mystery is about imaginary, too perfect to exist triangles. And the question is whether that these perfect lines meet in a perfect point in mathematical reality. No pencils, no microscopes will help you now. This thing right here, the ruler, it's useless. These triangles only exist in your mind. Even if you imagine a ruler, how useful is that? Not. But how are we to address such a question? Can anything ever really be known about such imaginary objects? What form could such knowledge even take? Before examining these issues, let's take a moment to simply delight in the question itself and to appreciate what is being said here about the nature of mathematical reality. Oh, hi, Lily. I didn't know you joined class. What we've stumbled onto is a conspiracy. Apparently, there is some underlying and yet unknown structural interplay going on that is making this happen. I think that is marvelous and also a little scary. What do triangles know that we don't? Sometimes it makes uh, me a little queasy to think about all the beautiful and profound truths out there waiting to be discovered and connected together. What exactly is the mystery here? The mystery is why. The only mystery, guys. Why would a triangle want to do such a thing? After all, if you drop three sticks at random, imagine, imagine, close your eyes, imagine, you have three sticks, you drop them at random. They usually won't meet at a point, right? They don't all meet at the same spot. They look something like this. Yeah. Maybe they don't intersect, but let's pretend these lines are infinitely long, so they always will, right? The infinitely long sticks. They're going to do something like this. Having them intersect like that would be very, very difficult, right? Exact. What we are looking for is an explanation. Of course, one reason why an explanation may not be forthcoming is that it simply isn't true. That's always a possibility in here. Trust no one. Maybe we fooled ourselves by wishfully thinking or clumsy drawing. There's a lot of fudging <laughs> in physical reality. So maybe we just couldn't see the little triangle where the lines cross, right? Maybe there's a little triangle right there. They don't perfectly intersect, right? Looks like there might be a little triangle. Right? How can we tell? On the other hand, it's certainly the kind of thing that could be true. It has a lot of elements that mathematicians look for. This guy right here. Naturalness, elegance, simplicity, and a certain inevitable quality. Why is it inevitable that they're going to intersect at a point? What we mean by that is, if you drop the sticks enough, right, eventually they're going to land all together, right? It might take a bajillion years, but it could happen, right? So it's probably true, but again, the question is why. We don't care what is true and what isn't true. That's not what we're interested in here. What we're interested in, if it is true, or if it is not true, why is that the case? That's where the interesting stuff happened. Who cares about how sticks fall? No one. Why do they fall like this? I don't know. That's a little more interesting. Now, here's where the art comes in. In order to explain, we have to create something. You have to create something. You know how you create a song? You start writing it. Don't be worried about the lyrics are going to suck or the music's bad or any of that stuff. You judge your work after you create it, not during. If you're an artist, you see every single pencil stroke, every single brush stroke, all the stuff that the person who's viewing it, the audience, is never going to see and know was there because you were there at the birth of its creation. You know it intimately. You're judging it on something that doesn't really exist. It was only there when you were there. You have to judge your work after the fact, not during. Otherwise, you'll never create anything. If you don't write a song unless it's an amazing song, you're never going to write any songs. You have to create a crap ton of crappy songs in order to make good songs. And that's part of it. It's not, oh, I made the song and it sucks. Oh, man, I'm ashamed of it. No, you made the song and it sucks because that's what you do to get to a good song. But you have to do that process. Same thing in math. You have to do crappy math work to get better at it. That's why we're doing a portfolio. Tests don't make sense. Do it perfect or else. Portfolio says, look. Do it. Do what? Whatever you want, but do it. And then I'm going to tell you what was good and what was bad, and we're going to talk about it. That is how math is done. Same thing with art, because math is art. In order to explain, we have to create something. Namely, we need to somehow construct an argument, a piece of reasoning that will satisfy your curiosity as to why this behavior is happening. This is a very tall order. For one thing, it's not enough to draw or build a bunch of physical triangles and see that it works more or less for all of them, right? You could show it for 100 triangles, does that mean it's going to work for all triangles? No, it doesn't. That is not an explanation. It's more of an approximate verification. 
Ours is a much more serious philosophical issue. Without knowing why the lines meet at a common point, how can we know what they actually do? In contrast with physical reality, there's nothing to observe. How will we ever know anything about a purely imaginary realm? The point is, it doesn't matter so much what is true, it matters why it is true. The why is the what. The why is the answer. Not that it's five. Why is it five? Not that I'm trying to minimize the value of our ordinary senses. Far from it. We desperately need any and all aids to our intuition and imagination. We need drawings, models, movies, whatever we can get. We just have to understand that ultimately these things are not really the subject of the conversation. And they can't really tell us the truth about mathematical reality. Now we really are in a predicament. We have discovered what we think may be a beautiful truth, and now we need to prove it. This is what mathematicians do. And this is what I hope you will enjoy doing yourself. Is this such an extraordinarily difficult thing to do? Oh my god, yes it is. Is there some recipe or method to follow? No, there isn't. This is abstract art, pure and simple. And art is always a struggle. There is no systematic way to create beautiful and meaningful paintings or sculptures, and there's also no method for producing beautiful and meaningful mathematical arguments. Sorry. Math is the hardest thing there is, and that's one of the reasons why I love it. Same thing with justice, same thing with peace. So no, I can't tell you how to do it, and I'm not going to hold your hand or give you a bunch of hints or solutions in the back of the book. If you want to paint a picture from your heart, there is no answer painting on the back that you can look at. There's no odds on the back of a painting. If you're working on a problem and you're stuck in pain, welcome to the club. We mathematicians don't know how to solve our problems either. If we did, they wouldn't be problems. We're always working on the edge of the unknown, and we're always stuck until we have a breakthrough. And I hope you have many. It's an incredible feeling. But there is no special procedure for doing mathematics. You just have to think a lot and hope inspiration comes to you. But I'm not going to drop you in the jungle and leave you there. I'm going to give you some advice. The first is that the best problems are your own. You are the intrepid mental explorer. It's your mind and your adventure. Mathematical reality is yours. It's in your head for you to explore anytime you feel like it. What are your questions? Where do you want to go? I've enjoyed coming up with some problems for you to think about. Sure, I'm going to give you some problems. But there are, these are merely seeds to help you plant your own jungle. Don't be afraid that you can't answer your own question. That's the natural state of a mathematician. We don't know most of the time. Also, try to always have five or six problems you're working on. It's very frustrating to keep banging your hand against the wall over and over. Don't treat it like homework. I gotta do this. Ugh, I don't know what I'm doing. Seriously, take a break from a problem always seems to help. Another piece of advice, collaborate. If you have a friend, that's a lot for some of you, who also wants to do math, you can work together and share the joys and frustration. It's a lot like playing music together. Sometimes I'll spend six or eight hours with breaks working on a problem with a friend. And even if we accomplished next to nothing, we still had fun feeling dumb together. Right, boys? So let it be hard. Try not to get discouraged or take your failures too personally. It's not only you that is having trouble understanding mathematical reality. It's all of us. It's always an us problem, not a you. Don't worry that you have no experience or that you're not qualified. What makes a mathematician is not technical skill or encyclopedic knowledge, but insatiable curiosity and a desire for simple beauty. Just be yourself and go where you want to go. Instead of being tentative and fearing failure or confusion, try to embrace the awe and mystery of it all and joyfully make a mess. Make a crappy song. Paint a crappy painting. It's part of the journey. Yes, your ideas won't work. Yes, your intuition will be flawed. Again, welcome to the club. I have a dozen bad ideas a day, and so does every other mathematician. I have a dozen bad ideas before noon. Now, I know what you're thinking. A bunch of fuzzy romantic talk about beauty and art and the exquisite pain of creativity is all well and good, but how on earth am I supposed to do it? We ended on page 10. If it sparks an interest in you, go read it. It's on Google Classroom. If it doesn't spark an interest, don't read it. But it's something you can write about in your portfolio. I would encourage you to read up to at least page 12. Your call. Bye. Love you all. Bye, Gina. See you all tomorrow. Ooh, it's algebra time.